right, we're going to start kicking it off. So first of all, thank you so much, First Round, for hosting us tonight. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm actually going to introduce Chauncey, who's going to give us a quick welcome from First Round. And so this, uh, this microphone is only for the purposes of video. So we have to use it, but it's not going to amplify our voices. <laughs> that is very helpful to know. <laughs> Welcome everyone, I'm Chauncey Hamilton. I'm um, the COO of Dorm Room Fund, which is first round student run venture fund. And I'm very excited that there are three dorm room fund companies here tonight in your group, which is super exciting. So we could not be more thrilled to be hosting you here for the culmination of All Raises Seed Bootcamp. It's especially special for us because we were, we led Felicia's seed round at Binti. So you're, we're hoping, <laughs> We're hoping that all of you, when you are ready to raise, will reach out to us. Um, we would love to talk to you all and hear everything about what you're building. And then just want to say one last thing that we also have um, presents for you guys. If you see over here, there are t-shirts that say the future is female founders. So we could not believe in you guys more and are so excited to be a part of this. So thank you guys. Thank you so much. I told Shanti they're the only VC that has given us presents. So they definitely win on that front. <laughs> Um, <laughs> so welcome everybody. This is the fourth week. I can't believe how quickly it's gone. Um, and to recap of what we've covered and what we're going to cover tonight. So the first few sessions we've covered um, how to decide if you want to fundraise, how to know if you have product market fit, how to find it more quickly, how to make a pitch deck, how to make an investor blurb. Um, how to run a tight seed process, how to set your valuation. And then tonight, we're going to focus on how to actually talk to investors. So after you pitch them, they're actually going to talk to you. And we have to um, do Q&A back and forth. So we're going to go through that. Um, we're going to talk through how to project confidence in your pitch. Um, and then how to close investors, actually ask for the money. And, and then also how to handle the emotional uh, roller coaster that fundraising is. And finally, how to decide if you want to announce your round in the press, and if you do want to, some tips on doing that. Um, and then at the end, we'll also just, um, so as, as normal, we'll have our panel, and then we'll have Q&A. And then at the very end, we'll also just talk about next steps for how we can stay in touch. Um, and I think all of you are in the WhatsApp group, and we also shared everyone's contact, but we have some other thoughts on that too. So. Uh, okay, so we can just jump in and, and get started. Um, so first of all, would love for the panel to get to introduce themselves. So um, maybe we can just go around and just say, if you're a founder, your name, your company, perhaps like how many employees you have and how much um, how much funding you've raised. And uh, yeah, we could start with that. <coughs> so hi everyone, uh, my name is Deepika. Um, I'm one of the founders of Athelis. We do um, computer vision for blood testing. Um, maybe a month ago, we were eight employees, and now we're around 20. Yeah. So, <laughs> oh, but that's, yeah, now I guess we're 20 employees. It just doesn't feel that way. How much funding did you raise? Um, in total, I think we've done 18, maybe ish, I think, around there. Hi, I'm Ritu Narayan. My name of my company is Zoom, Z-U-M Zoom. Uh, we are building the platform for safe and reliable rides and care for children. Uh, we have raised 70 plus million dollars. Uh, That's seven zero. <laughs> seven zero, uh, and we are 130 plus people. Awesome, and I've introduced myself, but I'm Felicia, CEO of Binti. We've raised $14 million, and we build software to improve foster care. I'm Nairi Hodajian. I'm the chief marketing officer and one of the consumer investors at Canaan, which is an early stage venture firm um, that invests in both tech and life sciences. And before joining Canaan, I was um, early at Uber, where I helped scale the global communications team. We raised a lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Zara. I'm uh, on the organizing committee for this boot camp with Felicia. Proud to be helping. Um, I'm the founder and CEO of Monty Kids, which brings Montessori education to babies from birth to three before children pr start preschool. 
Um, 85% of the brain is formed by age three, in case you didn't know that. Um, and we have raised six million um, in uh, angel and then a seed round. We'll be going out for series A pretty soon. And we have 16 people at Monty Kids. I also, sorry, yep. can I just say, I did um, Shark Tank and <laughs> the pitch, which is like the podcast version of Shark Tank and rolled those into our seed round. So I've done public fundraising, which is a whole other story, but I'm happy to chat if you have questions. Uh, I'm Jessica Varelli. I'm a general partner at GV, or Google Ventures, and also a founding partner of Hashtag Angels. So I've been investing at GV, um, primarily Series A and Series B. We're actually a stage agnostic venture firm, so we do um, from A all the way on to sort of multi-billion dollar valuation and financings. On the hashtag angels front, um, I've been a really active angel investor. So much more exposure there at the pre-seed, seed, and in some cases, Series A stages. And I spent almost nine years at Twitter helping grow that company um, from a pretty small startup to a public company and similarly a lot of, lot of financing and fundraising along the way. Awesome. Okay, so to kick things off, I want to start with um, projecting confidence in your pitch. So we all know that projecting confidence is really important. Would love to get tactical and just talk about some tips on how you do it when you're fundraising. And then maybe the investors can kind of share their impression or kind of like, you know, tips from their side as well. Um, I, can, I can kick it off with one point just to get juices flowing. So um, I think that investors um, determine their confidence in your company based on your confidence in your company. And so you really need to, before you go out and fundraise, have a lot of confidence that is real in your company. Um, so you need to feel going into that pitch like this is a great business that investors would be lucky to invest in. And if you don't feel that way, you should kind of do the things you need to do to feel that way first because um, investors will be able to, to feel that. Um, <clears throat> so I would say that's uh, the first thing. And then if you do feel that way, really have that attitude and, and know that investors – their job is to invest in companies that are gonna make a lot of money. And if you believe that you are one of those, then like they're really lucky to get to invest in you. And so you don't wanna go in super arrogant, um, like put your feet on their desk or something, but um, but you kind of wanna have that attitude a little bit, you know, that's like, look, I, like this train is moving, I'm gonna be super successful, like would love to partner, but if not, I'm gonna like get money from someone else too, because we're really awesome. So I think you don't want to say those exact words, but I think you like investors can feel if you if you believe that. Um, and I think a lot of founders go into fundraising more like too deferential um, in the emails and in in their meetings, and almost like the investors doing them a favor um, and like thanking them for meeting or that kind of thing. And you just want to be really careful not to come across because that will give the impression that you don't believe that about your company. So those are some intro thoughts that we'll love to pass it around. Totally agree with you. Like uh, investors sense your confidence, and they actually uh, project that to the company's confidence. Uh, for me, confidence is a matter of preparation. Like you have to prepare and know what uh, know your investors, why they are a right match for you. That's very important. For example, like I raised a, a pretty large seed round when I was raising from Ulu Ventures. Ulu Ventures. And uh, Miriam Rivera, who's a partner there, I knew that she had faced this problem for her teenage daughters forever. And relating, relating to them quickly builds that confidence and rapport very quickly if, they, if you know about their background and why they would be interested in your solution. Uh, that's one way of about it. Customer stories is a second way of projecting the confidence really well because when you know your customers are getting impacted by your, project, uh, your product so positively, uh, you can get other people excited too. So narrative around the customer stories is uh, the second thing. And the third thing I would say is the data. Like if you are, if you know your metrics or your number or your market size or, or those kind of things, those are other things when you have it on your tip that builds a confidence to you because you're going to be asked those questions anyway. But when you have rehearsed through and you know about those things that can quickly bring confidence to you. Just one, one thing to add. Yes. Uh, okay, that, that, that's a good point. That's a really good point. Really good point. Yes. Do you want to go ahead? Either way. Um, 
So I would say um, for, I can only really speak to my experiences, but um, for, <coughs> for me and for me and my co-founder, when we, went, we walked into uh, you know, different VC firms, I, you know, we also come from the perspective that we don't love to raise money and like I think we go in just already a bit more cautious and I think that in many ways that kind of helps us because you know we're we're obviously not we're not super super deferential because in many ways like I don't really want to raise money right and so um, but I think the one thing that we're just clear about is when you walk into these meetings, just have three things that you're going to say. Just three things that you're extremely confident about. And for us, you know, it was always clear what our milestones were going to be, our timelines to get to those milestones, and then the dollar signs associated with everything. And like, that was it for us. And I think that, like, we don't, we didn't know much beyond that. And so, but we were very sure of those things. And, the, and I think I can say that, but then also if you just kind of create things where, you know, you, you're saying, you know what, we said this in the past and we did it. And we said this in the past and we did it. You just kind of create that sense of like, that you yourself have, you know, walked the talk or whatever. Um, then like it, it kind of creates that um, trust in what you're saying. And then people that buy into that are people that you want to work with. Um, so I, I think it's like in one way it's like a good filtering mechanism, but it also just happened to be the just like the way that we approached it because we were super naive about the whole process and still are. Um, so I think that's that would be my two cents. Awesome. I'll add. Um, uh, and hopefully it's okay, I'm gonna give you guys a little bit of real talk on the VC side here. I would love to sit in a room with an engaged audience like this full of VCs and talk about how we need to create environments that make people feel confident when they come into pitch. So on one hand, I'm just like, oh man, we still have to be adjusting to all of this, and we do, and that's why this stuff is so important, because we want everyone to be successful, but like, oh my goodness, the VCs need to be doing their side of the work here too, and like making sure like we create environments where people can walk in and feel confident, and I think there's still a lot of work to be done there. Um, I will leave you with one tip on this point. Start with your friendlies first. And that might be, in my case, I have a, um, one of the women in our hashtag angels group is starting a company. And she was currently in the process of fundraising with angels and a couple seed firms. And she met with myself and the rest of our hashtag angels group, um, who are like sisters to her, you know, and ran us through the pitch. Um, and we gave her all of the tough but loving feedback around we just want this to be as awesome as it can and you don't need to have your guard up with us like let's just go through it and then gave her some feedback on you've done so much work here and you have so much expertise but this is so long and it's so hard to follow so let's work on taking you know 30 slides down to 12 and like what do we think are your crisp points on the you know the headlines people want to remember so start with your friendlies first to give you that safe space to get the feedback to get it really right and for some of you maybe that's people in this room and new relationships with folks who are going through this as well or some of the folks up on this panel but find that community to just work with you on getting down to a routine so that by the time you walk in to an investor you haven't met before you feel really confident that you've done the preparation and are ready to go I know. Weigh in. Okay. Um, so I think what Felicia said was so true. It has to be real confidence grounded in this company is amazing, but also I am amazing. Investors are looking for, are you the right person to do this? And so like first step one is like tapping into that real, like, yes, I am. Um, and, and then it's scary, right? Um, so just some practical tips. I, I got a lot of advice like when I was first starting to fundraise, like wear high heels, like wear expensive earrings because they don't want to give money to people who look like they need money. Like these, like that'll, you know, that'll make you look confident. I think wear like whatever makes you feel awesome. I wear sneakers because I feel like powerful in sneakers. I um, also do something that makes me feel confident before I walk in the room. So for me, I actually like put in my headphones, 
in the parking lot or in the bathroom, like I'll dance it out to a Beyonce song. Um, because I like, yeah, and maybe like whatever it is, like deep breathing, dancing, calling your spouse or your boyfriend or girlfriend or whatever. Um, I think doing that before the meeting can really just like center you. Because if you're just like prepping and memorizing your financials and you're not gonna go in like your best self, so. The last point um, I'll make on the authenticity front is that they, investors are trying to figure out if you're going to be the right person to helm this company, and there will be things that are hard and go wrong. And so don't worry about always having the right answer or imagining what they want to hear. Just be your true self and give an answer. And sometimes that may be, I don't know, but here's how I would think about it. And that way they get to know what you're really all about. And I would say there may be VCs who don't love that. The vast majority will um, prefer to get that real talk from you. But you have to also just give them insight into how you tick, um, which is a lot of what people are backing at these early stages. Awesome. Those are great. Um, I have a, f a few random tactics that I use and kind of similar to Zara they're personal to me so I think you should come up with for you but like one time I, I noticed um, I, I worked at another company before starting Binti and I noticed that the f one of the founders when he was trying to make a point he would shake his head um, that he was trying to convince you of <laughs> and I found myself like shaking along with him and I was like I'm gonna start doing that when I'm trying to convince <laughs> someone so I like actually do that I'll be like so we're you know gonna be a billion dollar company or like whatever I'm saying and people are like uh-huh um, so <laughs> so I think it's like I don't know there's certain like confident gestures that you can adopt that might feel right for you. that's one that I use um, I don't use it if I'm like at my company trying to get other people to disagree with me um, <laughs> Uh, another thing I did was uh, when I was pitching, um, I used a prop, and for me, it just made me feel kind of powerful. And so, um, you know, with our company, we try to automate the paperwork for foster care and adoption. And so, I brought this like huge binder of paperwork, and I, I like slammed it on the desk at one point in the meeting, and it just kind of like you know jarred people, and it, it made me feel confident to do something like that. So. Um, if there's some, you know, just think about what are, what are things that you can do that would set you apart a little bit. Um, I think people, like, I did this at, at first round and they ended up leading my round and, and people that I didn't even meet, um, months later were like, oh, you're the woman who slammed the binder. <laughs> um, <laughs> so <laughs> it was memorable. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and then another, another thing is I like to really show that I am directing the conversation. And so um, sometimes investors will start going down like a rabbit hole that you don't want to go down and might not actually be super relevant. And so I think it's okay to really take control of that. And so one thing that I like to do is say like, well, you know what, that's actually not super relevant, but a better question is boom, and then answer that question. Um, <laughs> And not be super rude about it, but I think it just shows, like, look, I'm the expert in this field, and let 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 me get you on track, um, versus just like going down whatever question they take you down. Can I add tactically yeah. to that one? There, will, you'll always be presenting to groups where one of the investors, usually not the person who's sponsoring your deal, is going to start asking questions that you're going to get to like later in the deck, and that's another place to take control mm -hmm. instead of actually being like, oh, well, I can fast forward to that, or oh, yeah, I have, I'm going to get to that why don't I just keep going on this section? And then if you have questions after we go through the pricing slide, we can come back to it. Mm -hmm. Another place to, it's really important to exert control because it can throw you off your flow. That's a great point. Okay, awesome. So, can I just yeah, yeah, thing? for sure. Sorry, we have so much to add. Yeah. Um, I, I want to say that this is, um, a pr like all of this, a process. So you might start off doing one thing and then just like assess how you felt, like be really in tune with yourself. So an example, um, I used to take my product to my pitch meetings because I felt like I should, I have to take my product. I have physical product and digital product. So I, but we have Montessori, our physical is Montessori toys for babies that come in a box. And I wanted them to see like, it's such a big box. It's so valuable. There's all these amazing wooden toys, but it's heavy. And I would walk into these meetings like, oh, and <laughs> they would often be like, oh, let me help you. Cause you know, it's like some strong man and I'm a s small girl and, um, and they would help me and I, realize like that sets me up not uh, not confident mm -hmm. and so I stopped taking my 
product to meetings. And if they wanted to see it later, fine. Um, I showed them pictures, but like just that, only because of the confidence piece. So just like assess um, how you're really feeling in, in the moments um, and, then, and then revise. Mm. That's a great point. Okay, awesome. So now let's move on to tactical tips about answering questions. So I think a couple of sessions ago, Aileen Lee took us through great slides on how to make a pitch deck and we, we talked about that. Um, and you'll, you'll do your pitch, but then people are going to ask questions too, and you have to answer those. And so just kind of like, you know, go through tips on answering questions. What are the most common questions that we'll get asked? Just, you know, general tips on what are good answers, what are not good answers. So I realize this is a broad question, but, um, do you want to start? Yeah. Okay. Um, so I would say my number one thing about answering questions is be so concise and then oftentimes what I find happens is you'll answer the question and then the investor will just be quiet and then you kind of just start filling the space and you're like okay so I you know we're gonna do this much in revenue this year and then they'll be quiet and you'll be like oh but um, you know obviously like if something happens then you maybe maybe we won't or <laughs> you know like and you're just like filling up this space of because you think it's uncomfortable but like I almost feel like that's a tactic that people use to make you just keep talking and when you just keep talking you end up saying like things that are weak you know because you're not prepared to continue talking and so um, I just think that it's better when you're done with what you're saying when you're done answering the question just be okay with the silence because there there will be I mean I don't know if that's just unique to like me and my investors but there's silences <laughs> and uh, and then it's like okay great you know and then they move on and it's and it's like we've moved on it's not I just wouldn't fill the silence so actually you know your business the best that's one thing to remember like uh, investors are asking you questions because they want to learn about you like r rarely you may find somebody in the group who's trying to be entire project like they're trying to hard, uh, ask hard questions and on purpose or without purpose but usually they're trying to learn more about you and just that orientation itself changes how you address the question because sometimes you can be defensive if you're thinking oh they're attacking your company or they're asking you tough questions uh, especially regarding competition or other areas that you may get sensitive as a founder but just remember they're trying to learn about that area that orientation itself helped me a lot the second thing was we were in a tricky area where uber and lyft were always there these big companies and giants always on the cloud and there were some sensitive questions it's better to be prepared and stick to the script uh, like why would this not happen or why would trust and safety not be an issue for you or why would this one just be prepared and just stay on the script and that really helps but, but rest of the things remember you know the answers the best and they're trying to learn from you in terms of preparation i think um it's uh you will come across really strong and prepared if you anticipate those key questions. Better yet, you can even put a page or two in your appendix. If you know, they're, they're likely to ask about this and then you can say, great question, we thought quite a bit about this and just flip to that slide yeah. and they've got your talking points. Yeah. Um, and if folks go down a path that just feels like kind of off topic or a little bit irrelevant, find a short, concise way to acknowledge and move on. You know, that's a good question. We don't think that's the key risk for the business right now. We're more focused on our key points. Um, and so um, I think those are two ways to handle that. Um, have you guys read the Harvard Business Review uh, article on prevention versus promotion questions? I don't know if we sent that out. Um, so there's this study that was done um, which showed that m VCs, men or women, ask female founders predominantly prevention questions um, and then ask men promotion questions. So asking women like, you know, when are you, what does it take to break even versus asking a man like, how, how big could this be? You know, like, um, or asking a man about the vision um, and asking a woman like, you know, 
um, how many users do you have? Like, um, and, and that actually mm -hmm. traps women because now you're like, well, crap, I gotta answer all these prevention questions and we're having a whole conversation about um, not losing versus like winning this big thing, right? So just flip it around. Um, and, and the research shows that women who just flip it and say like, let me tell you how big this could be. Let me tell you about the vision. It's like the, the numbers are staggering um, with how much more they'll, fund, they'll raise. Um, and that, and it happens a lot. When I read that study, I had actually finished my seat and I was like, oh my God, that's like, that happened to me. Um, so it'll happen. Um, and, and I would just encourage you to just keep redirecting them to the big vision, the mission, like the billion dollar thing, exit, all of that. One tactical piece of advice to address the filling airtime. It actually is something that um, I worked in politics before I switched to tech, and we used to teach female candidates for office, and I tell people and founders in our portfolio the same thing when I media train them. Because human nature is to fill silence, if you have a water next to you and you know, like female candidates would call their friends and family and say, hey, I'm running for office. Would you consider donating $10,000 to my campaign? or eight, or seven, or four, like really whatever you can do, um, which is a problem. You have to make the ask and close your mouth. And so what we would teach them is to have a water and just start drinking. And I, for those who tend to fill airtime, I say the same thing when you're meeting with reporters and the same is true for VCs. One, um, on the Q&A uh, side, one thing that comes up a lot that I think is a red flag for most VCs, just a small tactical thing, you may think you're gonna be acquired, you may be, optimizing for being acquired. You're not gonna really wanna tell your VC that because it means that it translates into they're optimizing for this outcome which may not be this big grand vision. Um, and so I would just be careful around like the exit potential of an M&A and building a business to appeal to those buyers. I think that's a great point. And I think like with this, so I guess adding to that, I think th the way that I like to answer it is sort of people ask who could be potential acquirers and you can flip it and be like, well, I really don't intend to be acquired. Like I'm looking at IPO, um, but you know, these companies would be interested, but we wouldn't. So you are answering the question and you're giving the answer of like, there are potential people, which people want to know that, but they want to think that you don't want to do that too. Yeah. And if you can, if they, if they were acquired <coughs> by a large sum of, for a large sum of money, you could also mention how much because um, they love to hear that. But mm -hmm. like, I am in, this is my purpose, this is my passion, I'm in this for life. Mm -hmm. Never selling. Never, ever. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I buy other companies. <laughs> um, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I buy other adoption <laughs> software companies exactly. for breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> um, one other... <laughs> One other comment on answering questions is just know your numbers. This was kind of alluded to, but um, know the numbers, like know your growth rate, know like if you're acquiring users, what's the cost of that? Um, and if you practice early on, you'll get these questions and then you can just know what the questions are. I would normally have a Google doc of the questions that I'm getting asked and I just write like good answers to them. And, and you know, in your early friendlies, like Jessica was saying, you'll, you'll get a sense of, hmm, they didn't seem too happy when I said it that way. And then you try a different way and you're like, they seemed really happy, I'm gonna say it that way. And you kind of just iterate on how you answer questions based on the reception. Um, and then also, Neri kind of alluded to this early on about um, if you, it's okay if you don't know everything, but I think that it is important how you say it, kind of tying in with the confidence piece. So I think, and I think that Prior to Binti, I was also on the in investor side, and I noticed that on average, like women would answer questions they weren't sure about a little less confidently, and I think it makes a big difference. So I think if, for example, if a man is asked, like, how much does it cost to acquire users, they'd be like, it's $20. And then a woman would be like, probably with the same or more level of certainty, would say, well, I think it's 20, but we're still running some tests and like it's a little early and we'll, this is how we would, you know, find out more. And and so you don't want to over project if like you're not super sure about it. Um, <clears throat> but if you've run some tests, like it's okay to just answer the number. Um, and you can also say that in a more, in a more confident way, like, yeah, early test show it's 20, we're doing like this and that, but, you know, whatever. Um, but I think just be cognizant about how you answer and, um, 
and if you if you don't know, it's okay to say that. And you can say, "It's a great question. I'll get back to you on that." You know, and don't don't apologize that you don't know, and don't be like, "Oh, it's a great point. I never thought of it." Yeah, you're really good at this. Um, <laughs> like, <laughs> like, <laughs> thanks for the advice. Um, so don't do that. Just one, one yeah. more point. Uh, so actually, to add to your point, and I would love to hear from Jessica, given that you're at investor side, one thing that worked really well for me, uh, this was actually beyond seed in the series A, and I, we were going for Dream Investor. There were series of meetings, and every time there was a question I thought I did not answer well, or I was not satisfied, immediately after I came back, I did research, regroup with my founders, and send the answer in email. And it really, really helped because I was backing it up with numbers, data. In that moment, I may not know all the things mm -hmm. the way they were, mm -hmm. but it helped me out. But I would love to know from Jessica, like, would you appreciate that if a founder did that? Yeah, that sounds like a great tactic. I think specifically after you, um, sorry, after you meet, it's often the case that you'll send the deck mm -hmm. as a follow-up, and that's a nice chance to say, really enjoyed like really enjoyed meeting you or meeting the partnership. Um, I've attached my deck and um, some additional information that we didn't have a chance to fully cover. And you say, on your question around this, uh, it looks like the answer is, you know, and elaborate on that. Okay. Awesome. Yeah, in my follow-up, I like to include the things that they were excited about and the questions that they have because I think it's great to answer like, oh, this was kind of their big hang up. You want to give really good, like you're saying, but also it's nice to remem remind them of like, so I know you were excited about this, and then for your question here, you know, boom. And then one more tactic point. Just remind them of the timeline, like, and the train is leaving the station, mm -hmm. um, and that you've got a process, you have a timeline, that, you know, there's momentum. Um, uh, it's a nice way to, to just create that perception of market demand, and you're in control of the process. Actually, that's a perfect segue. But the next question was going to be about how to close investors. So... Uh, maybe you can kick it off kind of elaborating on that. But the, the <coughs> in the last session, we went through how to run a seed process and, and kind of like, you know, lining up your meetings and having them, you know, back to back and that kind of thing um, to create sense of urgency, um, which is a huge part of it. But now you're in the meeting and you have to ask for the money. So, um, you know, and give that sense of urgency. So do you want to maybe elaborate on good ways to that, that people come in for the close and create a sense of urgency? <laughs> yeah, I think it's common for the last slide of your deck to summarize the fundraising process. And typically that's, so we're looking to raise two and a half on a safe at a 12 million, I'm making up these numbers, but safe on a $12 million cap. We have 600K committed. We expect to finalize the lead in the next week and close the round in the next like two weeks or whatever, I'm making up all these data. But I think giving people, you know, the five bullets of these are the round details, here's the timeline. Ideally, we have this much committed, particularly if you have an anchor. As you all probably know, it's if you have a, f a small seed fund involved, they're typically the ones that are signing the term sheet and setting the terms. Once you have the lead, then you're like home stretch. <laughs> you know, um, getting the lead is the harder thing, um, and that's where you can say we have this much committed from angels. We're looking for a lead. We have um, we're expecting to finish that process in the next week. We have several interested parties. Would be excited to get to know you all better if you think this is a fit, um, but we're looking to make that determination in the, last, in the next week. Um, and so I think just being really clear about your timeline and specific about what you're trying to do, um, I think will set you up for success. Um, yeah, I think uh, we, it was talked about before in a previous panel, like have all your uh, I always have all my documents like ready to go. I won't even like take a meeting if that's not set um, and follow up right away if they if they commit during the meeting, send the documents right away. I there was some talk about like getting people to wire all on the same day. My lawyer like just set our close date like a little further in advance and so I just took checks as they came in. Um, and so you should definitely talk to your lawyers about that, but if there's if, if a VC says yes or an angel says yes, um, and then you give them like time, they'll often, something will happen. Um, and so I like to just take that money as soon as possible. Yeah, um, I agree with creating that sense of tight timeline. And if you're going into your first meetings and you have no cash committed, one of the things that you can say is, you know, we have 12 partnership meetings this week. Um, <laughs> 
and <laughs> ex- you know, like you got to pull out what you have. Um, and you know, people do feel pressure when they know you're going around town meeting with everybody else. So, um, I, if you need to, you can always pull that in. And then just a reminder again, as women, we do this less, um, VCs are negotiating with you. So don't forget to negotiate for yourself to get to close. Um, don't op, you know, just, it's a different for everybody and it's very personal, but, and there isn't a ton of room for negotiation at this stage, but, um, just remember that off depending on the VC and the conversations you've had to date, they may consider their first term sheet a starting jumping off point for negotiation. Awesome. Um, to close, I would say, um, yeah, when we said that, you know, we're talking to other people, we already have the terms. We just want to know, like, are you going to give us terms or is this like a moot point? Then it's kind of like, okay, you know, like, let's see if we want to do this. Like, let's actually get into this process. Um, for us, like, diligence is pretty extensive just because there's clinics, there's FDA, there's Theranos, like, <laughs> there are <laughs> lots of different things. Um, and so we like to just say, you know, like our, our diligence process, we're starting it with other investors like on Monday. We're, you know, if you want to be part of those conversations, like you can be, um, but you know, we don't want to move forward with this un- unless you guys are serious and like if there's terms on the table. And, um, and then, you know, it kind of like, so, you know, it forces their hand a little bit. You're just telling them what is, uh, you know, what the facts are. And so I think all of the things make sense, you know, creating a sense of urgency and um, negotiating and making sure that they're not lowballing you and you're being honest about like your evaluations and your numbers just because, you know, you don't want to be dishonest. And then later on, you're like, holy shit, like I have to sell my company for a lot of money to make this worth it for everyone. Um, so I think that uh, it, it all like all of those things make a lot of sense to me. Um, what will oftentimes happen, so your early seed round is um, is one of the rounds in the financing of your company where you can actually build a pretty big syndicate. Like you'll end up with a lot of investors. As you get to your B and your C, you probably have one firm that's leading, maybe one firm that's participating. And in some cases, you may choose to have a couple individuals join. But your seed round, you might have a dozen angels and one or two seed firms. It really is a syndicate. And as a result, if you um, have a really strong angel that wants to back you or a strong seed firm, they will be incredibly helpful to you in filling out the rest of your round. So when, um, as an angel investor, I have gotten a lot of deal flow through other angels who will send me a note, like Alad Gill, who's a prolific angel investor who I work closely with at Twitter um, and actually acquired his company a long time ago. He will send us notes saying, I'm really excited about this company. I'm investing. There's 50K left. Is hashtag angels interested? And then he will have communicated to the founder, or the founder will have asked him, hey, is there anyone else you think we should be talking to? And then so those, I would call them like your anchor angels or your anchor seed firms, can play a huge role in helping you build out that syndicate and close quickly. Because the strongest signal for an investor to get is from another investor that's also writing a check. Um, particularly if it's someone they've done business with before, that they respect, that that's sort of in their network. So for closing quickly, if you've got a firm or an anchor angel and you respect them, you ask them, hey, is there anyone else you think would be a fit for this round? Do you want me to, does it make sense to syndicate out 250 to your network? And you can fill that very quickly with a couple emails through those couple people. And in some cases, truthfully, they don't even take a meeting. <laughs> like they may be like, "Great, I'm in for this much." If you're in, they looked at the deck, and it's uh, and if you trust those networks, that can be a, a nice way to do that quickly. Yeah, actually, I was just going to say that. Like, to for us, initially, the angel round took some time. Like first few angels, it took some time, and we just played along that game of telling that we have closed this much uh, amount of money and this much is left, but. Uh, when the angel round got re- seed round got really accelerated was exactly we closed with Stanford Angels and Entrepreneurs and there were a bunch of angels who trusted them and immediately other people followed along and other seed fund followed along. So finding those uh, anchors or network of people who trust each other really, really helps in, in your process. Uh,
Awesome. Um, I have one one tactic on this, which is um, <clears throat> I think uh, similar to what has been said, like at the end of the meeting, I think s Jessica had really good wording to use. I, I have like another another thought on that, which is I really like to say, hey, you know, raising this amount, would love to have you involved. Um, are you interested? And then, you know, if, if they say yes, awesome. If they say I need to think about it, then say, okay, great. Well, it's, you know, it's Tuesday. Can you let me know by Friday? I'd love to hold your allocation. Um, I think hold allocation is a very confident term. I really like using that. Um, because <laughs> it's basically like, let me hold your spot because like you're, you're gonna lose your spot. When it's really like, I wanna like add money to my <laughs> round. Um, <laughs> um, and you know, give them a timeline because as, as we mentioned in the, the process one, you, you wanna get to yeses and nos, you don't want maybes. So it's better to have like three yeses, or sorry, three nos and one yes than like four maybes. So I think giving people a d timeline and they will agree to it. Um, like there's no reason, like there's nothing that three weeks from now they're gonna learn that they can't decide, you know, in three days. So I usually give three business days um, and then they agree and then, you know, remind them that evening with your awesome follow up of all the great, you know, answers to their questions and reminding them of the deadline. Um, let's see. Okay, cool. So any other thoughts on the closing? I'll add one more mm -hmm. point. Um, so typically for the this early round of your company financing, typically investors are taking a bet on you and your co-founders. It's about team and vision. Maybe you've got a product that you can demo. But if you do, you're ahead of the curve, and that's awesome. But I think for that reason, you... Think a little bit about the network you've been cultivating over your career. And again, this is a ton of privilege if you were fortunate to have worked with people at your prior companies or be in the network of people that are in the position to write a check. Um, but there are folks that um, uh, you may have in your network whose relationship or data points on you will not be starting at that first meeting. So some of the checks I've written What's given me confidence to write a check quickly it is colleagues I worked with for five years. And so when they come in to pitch their business, I have so much information about taking a bet on them. Um, and so think a little bit about, um, and again, there is just a lot of privilege in this, but if there are people for whom you've kind of been cultivating an investor-like relationship with for a long time. And also think about at every company you've worked for, y you were likely making money for someone else. So I worked at Twitter for a long time. A lot of people, like myself included, really benefited from that. But essentially, like, who are the people for whom I will have generated some goodwill with because I was doing a lot of work inside of a company that benefited a set of investors. And that's a nice, even though in some, over many years I was able to get to know that community, but even if you didn't know the investors in your prior company, you were a part of a network that made money for investors. Um, and so that's a group that when it comes to taking a bet on you, um, there is a dynamic there where folks do want to pay it forward and give, um, you know, support people in their network that have been a part of the companies they've been funding. Awesome. Okay, so now let's talk about, this is probably maybe my favorite topic of uh, the whole session, is talking about how to handle the emotional roller coaster of fundraising. Um, because it is, ex it's extremely important and it's real, so we should talk about it. Um, so I'll let someone else kick it off. I have a lot of thoughts on this. I but have a lot of thoughts ahead. as well. <laughs> um, so founders in general like over-identify with their company. That's normal. You feel like it's a reflection of you. And then you're going to go to many, many investor meetings and essentially say, like, this is me and this is my gift to the world. Isn't it wonderful? And you will hear a lot of people say no. It's not wonderful, <laughs> therefore, um, <laughs> you are not wonderful, right? Like, that that's the kind of what's going on in our brains. Even if we're not conscious of it, that rejection is hitting us, like, in our core because we, it is a reflection of us. So, um, I'm just, it, it's a hard process, even if you don't realize how much it's affecting you. Um, and a, a tip around that would be um, don't, don't make this your whole life, which is such a hard thing to do as a founder. Um, I'm a mom. Uh, I don't know how many of you in the room are moms. Um, 
but that's like a protective almost because I also have that identity. But if you, so family can be helpful, friends, like your hobbies, so many founders just like stop all of those things. Really, like I've, for many years, I've stopped everything except taking care of my kids and my company, right? Um, and only recently I'm like, wait a second, I have hobbies? Like what did they used to be? And reinvesting in friendships that I lost, like having that and making time for that self, it's not just like self-care. Um, it really is like the thing that's gonna get you through because it's, the, uh, it's your identity. Um, and building it in and making sure you even have time for it during the fundraising process. Like one of the reasons I don't fill my week with like endless investor meetings is because I need to make time for that stuff because when you're getting so many no's, like you need to like drop into your exercise class and feel who you are as a human, as a person, you know? Um, so, and, and if you don't do that stuff, it's so common um, that eventually it catches up and, and people burn out. So that's just a little bit. <laughs> that was actually a great point. Like it just treated as a part of the process, not the whole life. It seems like, oh, it's only two more meetings or maybe three more meetings and then it'll be all over and we'll be back to a normal life. But it takes longer than, uh, unless you get very lucky, it, it's usually a process. You will learn through it, first few meetings won't be so spectacular and by the fourth, fifth meeting, you'll start getting to realize the process, this is how it works and then the process will be on track and you'll actually be on the path of it. So I completely agree. It's only looking back I'm saying that, but it's true But now that I've done multiple rounds of funding, every round of funding will be the same and you see it as just the starting. You're gonna do multiple rounds and go places. So just start from the seat to take it as part of the part of the life. Like whatever works for you, the cadence works for you. Don't don't aim for like quick like oh this is gonna end very quickly. Let's end very quickly. It's also a, an opportunity to learn about your company. All the feedback that you're getting from the market it also helps you in future rounds. Like some of the people who were there part of the seed round, they actually helped us in the future round. So uh, just take it as a process and run with it. I would, I mean, I would definitely agree with that. I think um, the other thing that's super helpful is, you know, aside from saying, you know, this is like a thing that I'm doing um, for my company, it's like not an end in and of itself um, is an important thing. And then, you know, like the fact that we're, we're all super lucky, like we get to, you know, in many ways choose the people that we work with day to day, like our co-founders, you know, the employees that we have, like the executive teams that we build. And like, they're all like, we obviously like them on some level. And I think that like having uh, that group of people that, you know, you're kind of going in this with and like, they're fun to hang out with. And you, you should like, everyone's like, you know, when you start talking to each other as people, then you, it, it becomes like a much more, fun like there's more levity to the process which I think is um quite important because then you you and then you also kind of build like a whole like structure of an organization that feels like everyone is doing this together and like that's nice too because you have people to lean on um and I think that's important too and then I, I you know like making sure that you're not super compromising on like your eating habits, which I never do. I always make sure to eat all my meals. Um, <laughs> but, uh, and, and you know, like working out regularly and things like that. I think like I, um, you only notice it when you don't do it that it's like affecting you. But like in the moment you're not like, oh, you know, it's fine. I don't need to go to the gym today. And then like later, <laughs> you know, you're like that, that made me sad. <laughs> so um, yeah. So um, <clears throat> kind of as it's been alluded to, I think fundraising is definitely one of the hardest emotional things that I've done and that most I think most founders would agree with that um, for the reason that Zara said. Um, and I know that like one of my best friends said that her three lowest moments in her life were a really bad breakup and her two fundraises. Um, and for me, like my lowest moment in my life was a fundraise and and um, it's like, you know, and both of my fundraises, but my seed and my A were both about a month or less. Um, so they were very quick, like on the surface, they went really well. 
but even if it goes really well, you're still going to get a lot of rejection. Um, most people are going to reject you, even if that's like, wow, that was a really successful fundraise. Um, so I think I don't want to say that to like scare you away from doing it. I think you should all go and do it. I do think there's things like Jessica was saying that we should like educate the <laughs> VC community <laughs> to like create it to be less of a bad thing. Um, yeah. yeah, like we've talked about that in All Rays actually having like a reverse like panel of, yeah. of founders talking about why it sucks so much and then have VCs be like, okay, how can I change that? Um, so we so we need to do that, but but you also can't take, I don't know if you can take away the, the like rejection aspect, you know, so yeah. you can soften it and, and there's some like bad actors and that kind of thing. But, um, but yeah, I think the rejection is hard. So I try to remember that it's a numbers game. Like if any of you have done sales with your company, it's sort of like, okay, it's a funnel. I'm gonna talk to this many, like I only need this many to say yes. Okay, they said no, cool, I'm closer to finding like the one that's gonna say yes. So like if you can try to have that attitude, that can be helpful. Also, if you know that like it sucks for everybody, so it's not just you, it doesn't mean that you, you suck. Um, it doesn't mean that you're not gonna fundraise. It's hard for people that like, you know, on the surface, not, not everyone's going to be this vulnerable with you. Like on the surface, people are like, yeah, I raised. It went really well. We got a ton of term sheets, boop, boop, boop. But if, you, if you're like, they're, <laughs> you know, <laughs> but if you're like really close with them, they're going to be like, oh my gosh, I was like crying and like, you know, so you're not seeing the full picture, really. Um, and I would say, let's see what I'll say. I made some notes. Um, it's also helpful to remember that investors make very few investments. Um, so you could be a really awesome company, but they have certain like theses they're really excited about they're going after and you're just like not in line with that. Um, it doesn't, you know, so uh, just, you know, keep that in mind as well. And then have a, having a support system, Zara touched on this, but in my fundraisers, like I would talk to my co-founder and like I would have a meeting, like get rejected or have it go not well and then talk to my co-founder for five minutes and get reminded on why I'm awesome, why the company is awesome, and then like go to the next meeting. Um, and it's really helpful to have that. And I think if you prepare your co-founder or your friends or whoever and say like, I'm about to go through a really hard process. I'm about to get like, rejected a lot, even if it goes really well. Can you just kind of be my cheerleader for the next month? And and if they know that's, they're going to give you leeway, right? If you're a little short with them because you're, you know, sad or whatever, they'll, they'll like be prepared for that. Um, it was really sweet in my last fundraise. Like I, I, I kind of like overdid. I told like every like my like my family, like my friends. I was like, I'm about to go into like the worst <laughs> thing ever, um, <laughs> and like and literally like people like you know my family sent me like chocolates. A few of my friends sent flowers. Um, I was dating a guy just for a few weeks. He was sending me like puppy photos. Like like everybody was just and I was like, okay, this is good. So I think um, just over and it, I think it helps. So. I think overdo that. And then you guys can do it to each other too, right? Um, if you know someone is going through it, you can do it to them and then they'll do it to you. Um, and then after it, go on vacation. Um, or before it. Before it, yeah, that's good too. Um, I haven't gone on vacation since my A a couple months ago. I like, I was like, oh, I have to get back. And like, it was a huge mistake. I'm honestly still tired and like not fully recovered from it. I'm taking two weeks off in a couple of weeks. Um, <laughs> But I'm like not at a hundred percent, like because I just needed a break, so I would do that. Yeah. No, go ahead. Sorry, I just I I I know of some founders who took a vacation before, and I was like, that is so smart because you're. I mean, life as a founder is hard. It's not just the fundraising. Mm -hmm. So like getting your head in the game before is is a really good idea. Also, there's n like nobody will understand this like other founders. So mm -hmm. family and friends are like super important. But some of the best um, nights I've had was like our female founder get togethers in San Francisco, like so eye opening where everybody who like looks so successful on the outside is like complaining about fundraising. Like it's yeah. not just me. <laughs> it does feel like it's just you. Right. Like th yeah. it, this is they're only rejecting me everybody else is succeeding so keeping in touch with founders and then I just from a practical standpoint would s would highly recommend writing down a list of like these are the things I need in my life to feel healthy and well um, whatever they are and then writing that list and like slotting them in and then just making sure they happen because it's so easy to just be like oh well I have to keep going and today I'll just cut that out and tomorrow I'll skip that and I'll just get this done 
because it might be done like if I do that, I'll might, I'll finish sooner. But like it's a long game. Th cutting those things out isn't worth it. Love it. Uh, two tips um, that come to mind for me. One, be around people that believe. Mm, and yeah. one thing I've done as an angel investor uh, and as a VC and I saw really effectively done at Twitter um, ask some of your investors to come in for your Friday all hands or for a coffee or breakfast at the office. And if you have enough employees and it makes sense, do a fireside chat and let your team feel the energy from someone who's sort of noteworthy in the industry talking about why they're so excited to be a part of the company you're building. And just remind yourself of that. Like people believe in what you're doing. People are betting their career on joining you because they believe. And people are writing checks because they believe. So put yourself in a space to like absorb that energy and feel it when you when you need to get filled up and Twitter did this pretty effectively even as a you know a noteworthy sort of breakout company it was still an emotional roller coaster for the people that work there because of the perception of the company and when we would have fireside chats with these luminary investors that we all kind of held in this super high regard and we would hear them talk about why they thought the company was so special that yes you could be working anywhere in Silicon Valley but like here's why like going to battle every day at this company is so special and why this like career experience will be more interesting and more valuable than you know clocking in at a company that isn't such a fight and that mattered for employees too, to actually feel that positive energy so use those people and even as an angel I've done this with small companies I've invested into um, I like you have a um, a really simple process for trying to draw upon those like little daily habits that I feel like are important for my mental health. I call them my happy habits. <laughs> um, and I had to sort of figure that out when I was at a tough point in a, um, a different experience, living abroad, very lonely, probably depressed, and was just like, I gotta figure out how to take care of myself. And I, I forced myself to figure out what are the little things, um, little things every day that just make me feel better and I had to be kind of examined about learning what those were and it's even for me as little as like I really like having a coffee in the morning it's just it's like it's a nice way for me to start my day and when I get in tougher spots mentally I try to draw upon what I call my like happy habits and just know that that's like a safe place that I, I just it makes me feel a little better every day um, and so really tuning those when you're in those tougher moments I think is helpful mm -hmm. it'll make your fundraise go better <laughs> people feel that energy I, we call it sparkle habits in my house. I like that. Yeah. No. <laughs> my husband's like, you don't seem sparkly. I'm like, yeah, I haven't worked out in a week because you've been away and I've been with the kids. How about this weekend? Um, so uh, one comment, which is because you will be faced with rejection, just a reminder, it's hard not to internalize that. But it's really impossible to really be Teflon. Try to envision yourself as Teflon a little bit. But just remember this. VCs don't know. VCs yeah. are guessing. If you took the top five VCs, make a list, and they all looked at the same company, they would all say something different, especially for those who aren't already repeat founders. Um, you can look around at any big funding round, particularly at the Series A, but even at the seed, um, that goes on and there will be top tier investors who passed and there will be top tier investors who offered a term sheet. Just because they rejected you, it doesn't mean they're right. So just remember that it's one way to kind of not internalize the feedback. I think that's a great point. And I would, I would actually try to remind myself of that. And like, you know, like Airbnb really struggled to raise their seed round and, and so did a lot of companies that went on to be really successful. So I would, I would kind of think about that and be like, yeah, I mean, they don't know. So yeah, they're they would never tell wrong. you they're guessing. <laughs> they're not get like we're not supposed to tell you we're guessing, but we're guessing. <laughs> yeah, so I think having that having that inner confidence and being like, well, they're just they're just wrong, you know, um, is really helpful. Um, also, I think like we talked about running a tight process last um, last time. I think it's really important when it comes to this part because um, if it's gonna be it's gonna be hard um, doing it doing a really hard thing for a month is way better than doing a really hard thing for six months. Um, so just keep that in mind too. You want to be like really fast, get the money and get going. Um, well, any other thoughts on, I think uh, the other thing is Zara mentioned is having, having the network of other founders. I think that's so critical because the, the empathy, like, you know, your friends that have not fundraised, they can be like, oh, I'm sorry you're going through a hard time, but they don't really get it because they haven't done it. 
So other founders, like I love going to a founder happy hour and you're like, I'm fundraising and people are like, okay, okay, <laughs> let's get you a drink or like, let's, you know, and like, and that's like, it's really nice to have that, um, have that empathy. So know that you're not alone. Yeah, just say, please. Like, if you're real, they'll be real. Because if, if they're saying, like, oh, it's going, I'm a fundraising, it's going great. Then if you're just, like, a little bit vulnerable, all their stuff will come pouring out. <laughs> like, because not everybody, like Felicia yeah. said, not everybody's going to say, like, this is really rare and special, um, but you can, you can activate it. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. I have a question for the yeah, founders, yeah. actually. Can I ask yeah. one question? Because yeah, yeah, I yeah. heard this from a founder recently. Um, it's just to prepare yourselves. Once you're successful... He said that the one of the loneliest times for him was when the money landed in the account. Would you say that's true or false? It's just something to prepare yourselves for. It's like you're at the finish line, but then there's a different level of pressure that starts. Maybe. But I don't know. Oh, congrats. You guys have any thoughts on that? Um, I remember, um, I remember, like, before when I was still in school, when we were just like working on this um, as like a side thing, we spoke to a professor who offered us like a lot of mon more money than I had ever seen, and we went into that meeting and we were like, "This is what we're gonna do." And we were, this is the f like our first, or like one of our first meetings. We just like had no idea. And I was, we were so amped to go in. And then he, he was like, just categorically was like, you know, this is the m money, da, 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 da. And then uh, I, w we w I went outside and I thought it would be like this thing where you're like jumping in the air. And I just felt nauseous. Like I was just like, I like truly, I just felt nauseous. Like we, um, and like you, you don't even realize it, and then you like later read the term sheet, and you're like, please, oh. <laughs> I didn't read it. I someone else read it, and they're like, there are bombs in this term sheet. Um, so, but I mean, that was besides the point. I, I felt I felt better once I found out about that. But um, I I remember just feeling like nauseous, and that was like something I was not expecting at all. Um, yeah. Why do I think I felt nauseous? I don't know. Like. It's not a normal, f common thing for me. Um, I, I don't know. I, like I, I, it was just like a lot of. I guess like before that, you know, we were in school. We were working on this as like a side thing. It was so fun. We were like running around, talking to different people, and getting people excited. And then it, it just felt very it, like all kind of becomes very real all of a sudden. And so, um, yeah, I, I wasn't expecting that one. Uh, interestingly for me, I felt excited. <laughs> like I really wanted to pursue the idea and uh, make make it like now you had a chance to do it. But I can see why you would feel uh, l like because it's a moment of truth. Now you have to do it. Like maybe you were working and doing yeah. it on the side or yeah, yeah. studying or doing, but this is a moment of truth. Another thing is fundraising is such a hectic activity and it's a letdown. Like, oh, it's mm -hmm. got over. Now we have to get back to the work but it's exciting <laughs> I think in my seed I was excited um, and then with my a it wasn't it wasn't that I was like oh now I have to do it. but it was just it was so much just like tension and like I don't know I, I had a lot of stress like leading up to it and then I thought when the money got wired I'd be like woo and like just I don't know all relief and then I was like okay it happened um, Oh right, I haven't been working on my company for a month. What's going on there? Um, so, <laughs> so it was just kind of like it was anticlimactic. Um, and uh, and I do also think that there's like the opposite, which like I think some people celebrate too much, and they're like, oh my god, I fundraise. Let's have a huge party with like hot tubs. And um, <laughs> I mean, that's like the stereotype, but it's real. I mean, it really happens. So um, you know, and then you like start spending a lot of money on things and. Uh, and then, like, you know, the company fails because you were focused on 
that and like being successful at fundraising does not mean you'll be successful at running a business. They're, they can be like two pretty different skill sets. So I think that I know that and a lot of founders know that and like we don't want to over celebrate and we're like almost paranoid of over celebrating it so then you don't even celebrate it at all. So I might have overcorrected. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, celebrating is important. <laughs> Trains your brain to want to do things that are good for you but not too much. I think also there's... um. This, I don't think this is exactly what you're talking about, but there is this um, trap we can get into where we actually use, uh, when investors say yes, we take our confidence from that. Mm -hmm. Like as opposed to what Felicia was saying, like get super confident about your company, about yourself. Um, getting those yeses is like a boost, like, oh, they believe in me, so, so I must be good. Um, and that's very short lived. It's like a teacher giving a kid a gold star, you know, rather than like it coming from deep within. So there's a bit of a letdown after that. And like, I, you know, I wanted Lego to invest in Monty kids for like five years and they invested and I was just like, oh, okay. Like it, it gets old, like, it doesn't get old. It's fantastic and it's amazing. But if you take your confidence from it and you're not doing, I think the, the these mixed up reactions come from when you don't have that strong foundation of doing your happy and sparkly habits and like knowing who you are and why you're amazing and why you have worth beyond all of that. Um, it gets a little confusing when we're not on solid footing. That's a great point. Um, I think I got more clarity on that when I, as I shared in the previous session, that we went through a pivot and kind of like went through a kind of a dark period. And I think like people were all excited about us during the seed. And then we went through that. And then I think a lot of investors were like, eh, not going too well. Like e one investor even was like, maybe you should give the money back. Um, and yeah. And uh <laughs> And so, but I, at that point, I was really excited about the new direction already, and I was like, they're wrong. And then, like, and then they started getting excited, and I was like, ugh, like, yeah. it doesn't, <laughs> doesn't matter if they're excited or not excited, like, they just don't know. And so, like, I don't know, I think that, I think that having them, like, lose faith actually, like, helped me a little bit. And, and also made me, when they were, like, when I would then write the updates that were positive, and they are like, yay, I, like, even if it was different ones, I was like, whatever, like, <laughs> yay or, or not yay is like, yeah don't care um so anyway <laughs> basically what you're saying but i went i went through it in an interesting way yeah. um i recommend therapy also <laughs> it's really helpful <laughs> yeah therapy and or executive coaching i have a coach that's basically like a coach therapist that has been incredible for me and and friends girlfriends yeah. also can fill that same function if you don't have a lot of money for those other things. It's true. Mother. It's true. <laughs> Depending on your mother. <laughs> <laughs> okay, last question. Um, and then Neri's going to give us a quick presentation, then we're going to open for Q&A. Um, so last question is, let's talk about announcing your round. So do you want to announce a round? Do you not want to announce a round? <laughs> Perfect. I'll, I'll, I'll do that. Um, so yeah, just like um, maybe maybe the panel can just answer quickly yeah. kind of like oh, you're how you you've... Not talking or, or you can, yeah. wha whatever is easiest, but like, I thought the panel could just say like, why or why not they decided? And then Neri will, she's like the expert, so she's gonna walk us through some stuff. Um, yeah, so for us, um, we raised our round um, and then we, I was not planning on announcing it. I didn't want to do any press. Um, you know, obviously, like I said, because we're a company that does finger stick blood testing and <laughs> it was like at a bad time, so. <laughs> We didn't want to do that. Um, yeah. Anyway, so <laughs> we had to, uh, actually, like, that's pretty baller of our investors to invest in us at that time. Yeah. That's pretty cool. Um, but, yeah. <laughs> but um, we, we, I wasn't, we weren't going to announce it. And we didn't announce it for, like, maybe, like, four or five months. And then we started to, you know, when we started to talk to people, we realized that, you know, they, because of all the skepticism, the first thing they would do is Google us. And then there was nothing on Google about us other than some articles that like, maybe our like universities had put out about the grant money that we had raised, which isn't super inspiring. Um, and so, um, and so we, so then we did like a push 
Um, and it was exactly as we thought it would be. Like every article was like, these Stanford dropouts don't think they're the next Theranos. And like, you know, like <laughs> all of these articles. But the, the thing is that it existed online. And like the, you know, at that, that time, it's like, it's kind of predictable, I feel like, because people want to do what everyone's not saying. So like everyone's saying Theranos, Theranos, Theranos bad. And so then there was articles that were like, they say they're not Theranos, maybe they're not, you know? And so it's like, <laughs> and, and so it was like, it, it, like in the end, like the, the press was perfectly fine. Um, and because I feel like it's almost a played out story to be like, they are Theranos again, you know? And so um, we, we did that and I'm like, I'm happy we did it because there's like all of that stuff online. Um, then we did our, um, and, and that's how we announced it. For our, and we did that for our seed. For our A, we did not announce because um, for a couple different reasons, we're like in production now and the, you know, our customers are not really looking at um, whether or not we are like funded well or not, or like whether or not who, who did our round. And I just don't think it's, there's a huge utility to announcing it um, when, you know, people will just think, oh, you know, they, this is the amount of money they raised, not super well funded, like they're not a really big threat. And I kind of like that that's the attitude. Um, and then, you know, we'll just be quietly doing our thing because we don't need the press at this point. We have the publications, the FDA approval, and then just like our old, old press that we exist. And so that was kind of our justification. So in, uh, in our case, like in the seed round, we did not announce the amount of funding. We did the announcement of the launch of the company. And the reason being was there were two other competitors who were more funded than us. So we didn't want to be pairing as a fill. We, these are the smaller, less funded players. And that worked out really well. Uh, in uh, after series A, B, C, we announced all the rounds because we started catching up, and now finally we are actually the most funded company. So we want people to let know, and uh, schools are our customers, and parents are our customers. They feel really confident. And it's also very good for employees to know because everybody <laughs> searches Crunchbase when they decide to join the company. They are looking for who the investors are and how much money you have raised. So it's a confidence builder for that. And there was for us, there was no specific reason. Well, like Deepika pointed out, to just play it under the rug. So we, we ended up announcing uh, our series A, B, and C. We haven't announced any of our funding. Um, but to be honest, it's something I'm thinking through right now. Um, kind of similar uh, to Deepika, I didn't see a huge advantage. Like our customers are governments. They're like counties and states. They're not reading TechCrunch. They they're don't. they not used to working with startups. Um, and I also feel like we're in a, like a very unsexy space. Like a lot of people in Silicon Valley are not interested in GovTech and I kind of like that and I, I don't want to be like, ooh, look, we actually raised from like really top investors and you should start a company in this space. Um, so I kind of just like flying under the radar. Um, but I think that I'm rethinking it right now um, because we're, you know, we started selling to counties, now we're selling to states and I think it could give credibility when like trying to get attention of like governors and that kind of thing if we're in like New York Times and like really mainstream press. Um, so something I'm actively thinking through. Let's talk. Um, we are a consumer brand uh, and so PR is important for us and like parents are s searching, you know, and then like Lego invested, like that gives parents a good signal. Um, so we did announce, and then all PR is good for us. So we leveraged, you know, people might not want to write about a company that raises, like, f I don't know, like their first seed round, and it's not that big. Like, it's not so exciting. But coupling it with your story or, like, your perspective as a f minority female founder or whatever, um, and then rolling that together with the funding or and now being, like, an expert in this space because you have this validation. So you can get other articles that are not just about your funding leveraging that. Yeah, I think as you've all alluded to, I would start from a first principles point of view around what is the sort of strategic imperative of the company right now. Typically, funding announcements can be helpful for hiring mm -hmm. and for sales. 
but you want to ask yourself, is now the right time to sort of drop that bomb? And for some companies, if you are still really small, you're trying to make maybe one higher, you don't need broad brand awareness, and you haven't launched your product yet, maybe you want to wait to announce the funding when the product is launched to try mm -hmm. to like get more uh, PR boost and, and have distribution. Maybe if you are selling to customers who really care about does this company have staying power and they want the signal of are there reputable investors around the loop. Sometimes for GV, having Google's brand somehow associated with a company can be a really positive thing for companies selling into other more conservative buyers or customers or whatnot. And so I would just start from first principles. Typically hiring and sales are the two considerations and try to figure out if using that sort of arrow now makes sense or if it makes more sense when you're a little further along. Do you want me to? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, no, no, stay. She's, she's just going to take us through this. Um, oh, this is a clicker. Oh, yeah. Okay, great. So we'll zip through some of what we already talked about. Try now. There we go. Okay. This is about me. I'm Nairi. Um, I worked in politics, then I worked at Uber. Now I work in venture, no and always gives me joy. <laughs> okay, so. Just a reminder of where we are in the media landscape um, from a press perspective. The nature of news has changed. It's more cluttered than ever. There's more tension and less trust than ever between reporters and PR teams. But the good news is, because of Twitter thank you, and other platforms, it's easier to understand reporters' mindsets. This is important. I'll come back to that. Good PR stands out, and your owned channels provide huge leverage. We'll also get to that. So what does this mean for early stage startups and should you announce your seed round? Well, we covered that a little bit, but a couple of the key considerations that I work with our companies on, my team and I, will announcing the round support your business goals? How? Be very clear about it. Be very clear about it. It feels like a big accomplishment that you want to shout from the rooftops, but it's going to take your time away. Um, and it like, really requires a founder's time at the seed stage, so be really clear about how it can support your business goals. Um, Jessica already highlighted some of the key ways. Are you going to raise your Series A within the coming one to two quarters? If so, it's probably good to have something out there about you. That's another consideration. When are you, um, and also the targeting, right? So if you are trying to target governors, you're gonna want to run your press in a publication that will get syndicated and picked up by like the Houston Chronicle and the St. Louis Post Dispatch, like the AP or, you know, what used to be McClatchy, right? So it just, the targeting is important. If you're going to raise your Series A within the coming one to two quarters and you want to be on the radar of other VCs, you're going to want to run it in some of the inside the bubble outlets. How competitive a space are you in? The answer can cut both ways, right? Super competitive space well, I need them to know I'm around too. Super competitive space, I wanna stay stealthy and then just like come out with a bang once I'm really ready. Um, the pre-product thing is really important to consider too, especially in consumer-facing business. The last thing you want is to create a bunch of demand that you can't service. Then you have to figure out to do with your e what to do with your email list, which is a first world problem, but still. Do you have a compelling story to tell right now? Is your story pitchable? Be real about if it is. Um, and if not, don't waste your time. Is it an important use of your time as a founder compared to all of the other things on your plate? So these are kind of the key questions to ask. I would say at the seed stage, generally, it's still easier to pitch consumer than enterprise startups. It's not a funding announcement, period. If you look at any headline of a seed funding announcement, there is no dollars, there is no mention of a seed investment in the headline. Um, it's about the founder. It's about the market. Uh, it's about, this is the, I mean, I looked at two recently, like Celine Cruz, who some of you have met, who is part of Female Founder Office Hours. Um, the headline in Fortune about her funding round was, we work for direct-to-consumer brands. Um, we had a meditation startup recently launch. It's the Peloton of <laughs> meditation communities. That's literally what the reporters wrote into the headline. They need an angle. They need a story. The funding's not it. Flip side, the reporters say they don't care about funding, including, by the way, like decent sized series A's. But if you go to them without the funding as a hook, they're also like, yeah, but what's the hook? 
So it's a nice to have, and they can mention the funding in the story. They, if you have great investors in your syndicate, all the better. It only helps anchor the story, but it can't be the meat on the bones. It's like a little bow that you put on the whole package. Um, yeah, and the less your funding announcement is about your funding, the more successful you'll be in getting that story told. Uh, it's super important to think about the story that way. The levers you have to pull on are you, your background, why you started the company, the problem you're trying to solve. It's not that different from your fundraising deck at the seed uh, in, in the early stages uh, in terms of making a case for why your company needs to exist and why you're the one to build it. So that's um, one way to be thinking about it. Okay, so now that we're here, I can't leave this room without talking a little bit about what makes good PR, because there's a lot of bad PR out there. So here are the five most important elements. One, relationships with the right reporters. Um, that's why it's so great that you can just look on Twitter, LinkedIn, look at their byline really easily, aggregate what their interest areas are, see where they're speaking at conferences, because, I don't know, can't put a percentage on it, but it's in the high, I don't know, it's above 75% of your likelihood of success can be determined by targeting the right reporter. Which is why if a PR agency ever sends you a 100-person reporter target list, you should fire them immediately. Even if they send you a 50-person target list, you should also fire them immediately. It doesn't work, okay? It's all about targeting and finding the right reporter for your story and your company's story, okay? Just because Erin Griffith covers VC and startups at the New York Times does not mean she's going to cover your company. I can tell you, she's not going to cover your company at the seed stage. Don't have her on the list. Um, cold pitching generally doesn't work, which is why these relationships matter so much. If you can get a warm intro to the right reporter who happens to be based in the same city you are, who happens to have the same beat as you, I guarantee you, you have a high likelihood of getting your story covered. It's all about the match. Um, compelling narrative, repeated. You're gonna be so sick of saying the same three messages about your company through fundraising, through telling your story over the whole life cycle, through s closing your executives that you're trying to hire, um, but you just gotta keep saying it over and over and over and over and over again. Um, one of the bosses I had once said that repetition never spoiled a prayer. So just think of it that way. <laughs> because if you're sick of it, I guarantee you most people haven't heard it yet. Um, your comms should always be targeted towards business goals. You don't do it just for the sake of it. You wanna have really strate like important strategic goals in mind, and if you don't, then focus elsewhere for now. Um, I'm a big advocate of quality over quantity. Uh, if you get one, if your t core target is audience, is the VC community, you get one exclusive story by a great reporter who's read by that audience, it's way better than one in Silicon Alley and one in like the listing for PE Hub and like a million other brief mentions that agencies and bad PR people will use to show, look at all this volume and the impressions, and it means nothing. No one's learned anything about your company. So quality over quantity is how I'd always be thinking about it. Um, you know, and I would say that you don't want to sacrifice quality for quantity. You can go after both together, especially if you're in a consumer-facing business and you need to reach big audiences of um, consumers through lifestyle publications, but you can still do that with a high-quality bar. And then you always want to be proactive the fastest way to not be able to be proactive is to file your um, Form D. Don't do it. Find a lawyer who will help you figure out not to do it because it will be considered public um, to a reporter that you pitch. The first thing they're going to do is Google you, and you're trying to keep the like funding news they don't really care about, but they actually kind of care about as a hook. And then the minute they Google you and they see that it's been picked up in PE Hub because every filing is, it's over. Okay, 10 biggest myths about PR. First, you get to see the story before it gets published. Literally never. No matter how besties you are, your comms person is, the good reporters, like the top tier journalists and the good PR people will have a really close working relationship so that you'll get full, pretty full visibility into the story before it runs through a fact check process, but that's as close as you get. Press releases matter. They don't, don't do them. Um, they give you a little bit of SEO, but there are other ways to get SEO. Don't spend the like 1300 bucks. No one writes 
stories off of press releases anymore, unless you're like, you know, the president of the United States. <laughs> um, or a public company, which is also fair. Um, but in our, in our ecosystem, they just don't matter. Uh, and people say, but you know, the press release is a really good way for me to get my investors and me on the same page about the messaging. The press release is an archaic format. Write a messaging doc and use that to get on the same page instead that includes a tough FAQ. Uh, next myth, you have to hire someone with existing PR relationships in your sector. If you're ever ready to hire someone in-house in consumer companies, you'll be ready for it first. Optimize for the mind and the skill set. You can build relationships in that sector. The person can build reporter relationships in that sector as long as they've done it in another. It's actually not that difficult. Myth number four, reporters are not smart. Not true, actually reporters are really smart. Um, number five, PR people aren't smart. Um, also not true, good PR people are very smart. There are a lot of bad PR people out there who are not, um, but the kind you're looking for, um, you don't have to settle at all. They have really smart people out there because if you think about it, good PR at the end of the day is about finding a good argument and making that case effectively. Six, you can take something back, to, back after you already said it to a reporter. You can't, it's already done, sorry. Um, PR is magic, it will not solve all your problems. It will not close your fundraise. Um, so that's why you wanna be really diligent about why you need to do it. Um, myth number eight, interview prep is for novices. Um, there's a woman named Dee Dee Myers who was President Clinton's press secretary for a while during the dark days. Um, of the presidency, and she stood in front of the White House podium every day and answered questions from reporters, print, and broadcast. And then I worked with her at a firm called the Glover Park Group in DC. She went on the Sunday shows quite often, meet the press, face the nation, you know, all the political debate shows. She prepared like nobody's business every single time, and she had been on TV every single day in live Q&A, and she prepared every single time. So if Dee Dee Myers has to prepare every time she talks to a reporter, so do you. And the best way to prepare is to ask yourself the question you're most afraid you're gonna be asked and practice that question over and over again. Number nine, the press is out to get you. They're not, they are out for a good story. Um, and that's where you can turn things like Theranos to your advantage. So, you know, don't be, sh you know, that's a, that's a leverage point, I would argue, you know, for Debuca's company because you can actually use it to create a baseline foundation of press about your company and then you don't have to do a ton of comms over time. Um, but it's gonna be the narrative eventually, you might as well leverage it to your advantage. And then lastly, off the record is a thing. Uh, <laughs> especially if you say it after you say the thing. Oh, that was off the record. No, that's not how it works. Um, off the record is a useful tool if you wanna put something into someone's brain, a reporter's brain, that you kinda want them to use, but you don't want them like attributing back to you and they can't really put it in their story, but it's not really real, don't use it. Leave it to your comms people eventually. So, that's that. Okay, operationalizing for success within your companies. In order to use a relationship, you have to build one first. It's why you don't need a VC for the first time when you go in to pitch their partnership. It's exactly the same thing. So create concrete goals for relationship building if you've decided you wanna do some PR with the reporters. Six month planning, goals, key initiatives, editorial calendar. Um, do the work to develop your stories. So if you have people writing blog posts, I mean at the seed stage it's probably a little bit less relevant, but you may have a content focus to your startup. So be organized about it. Treat it the way you would treat, you know, the tech development and the product development. Um, build your press list, but be realistic. Get media trained and ask for fierce feedback. Um, everyone needs it, so do it. And hire, retain expert PR talent. Leverage your venture firms. They often have um, that in-house. Um, don't just add it to another high performer's plate. You wouldn't give coding to a lawyer just because you know the lawyer's really smart. Don't give PR to like biz dev just because the biz dev person's really smart. It's actually a real expertise. Okay, this is a quick one because I did a lot of this in my life at Uber and before. Um, in case you're ever in a crisis, this is what you need to know. You don't have a PR problem, you have a problem that's playing out in the press, okay? You need to find the Venn diagram of legal operations and comms, and that should always be a negotiation. If you only have 
ops and legal or you know the business and legal in that room or only legal or you let legal write the PR statement you're going to be in a world of hurt um, so you always have to have that Venn diagram and if you don't have an in-house comms person or a venture firm's comms person or a consultant you can pull in try to channel that think in a re like from a reporter's perspective from a reader's perspective is how we're thinking about this going to resonate or make more problems for us I can tell you like the worst things we ever did at Uber were those statements that the lawyers were like, you have to put this out. That happened like twice and never again. Um, <laughs> taking real action is the fastest way to stop the bleeding. This is not real, but if a toy is recalled, right? With the fa you have to take action. You can't just talk about what you're doing. You have to actually do things, and then you can say what you're doing. Be disciplined, rinse and repeat. Don't say too much, don't say too little, and then just say whatever you've strategically decided, say it over and over again. In a crisis, what you say internally, consider it external because people are worried, they're nervous, they're gonna talk to their friends, it's gonna get out, it's a small echo chamber. Winning in a crisis means not failing. So don't make more problems for yourself. You're not gonna like put points on the board with how you handle it. Um, and then finally, this is really small and tactical but massively important, turn off all your brand and performance marketing um, to consumers. I have a soft spot for crisis. <laughs> Call me if you're ever in one. I'll just do it for fun. No, I don't do it anymore every day. <laughs> okay, media training on one slide for those of you who are going to announce your round and do interviews. Number one, the questions don't matter. The question is a vehicle for you to deliver your one of your three messages. Now, if they ask you, um, what's your ARR again? And you answer with, our CTO's background is exactly what we need because we're built, like AI and ML is the, like, you know, that doesn't work. But what you can say is, you know, our ARR is, you know, five million right now. We're really excited about the way that our CTO and the product org, if that's like a, one of your key messages is about the tech team that you're building and the product org that we're gonna be building over time is going to really augment our ability to you know, double, triple, and quadruple that over the next four years because of X and Y and Z. You have to pivot out of the question so that you can deliver your message so it doesn't seem so obvious, but <laughs> just think about it that way. The question is a vehicle for your message. Practice matters, we talked about it already. Stop talking, so glad she beat me to saying it. Just stop talking. It's really awkward to have silence, but do it. Don't get angry, I see this a lot. Um, you know, it's a really hard job being a founder and like if a reporter catches you on the wrong day and has the like slightly wrong attitude and you don't hit it off and there isn't a lot of like goodwill and energy between you, it's easy to kind of get annoyed, angry and defensive. Don't, just don't because, especially like if they ask you about competitors, if they ask you about, um, you know, your funding details and they push you and they push you, just don't get angry, it, it, it will not serve you and then they'll just quote you that way and it's not a good look. We already talked about this, nothing's ever really off the record, and then repetition. And those are the most important things you need to know. I, you know, you should go get properly media trained with like a full hour and like video and playback so that you can really have the feedback on how you're doing, but this is a start. Um, I, that's me, that's it. And happy to take questions on this, and I know the panel is here for questions as well. Feel free to reach out. Um, I do this for our founders, I do this for friends, so um, happy to help. Thank you so Ta much. <laughs> Great, so now let's open it for Q&A and you can ask questions to anyone on the panel. It could be about all the topics we covered as well as to narrate about the press stuff. Have thoughts on that? 
I think you'll get different opinions from different people. I would say if you have like one of the hashtag angels or Elad Gill and is one of your early investors, you want to communicate that to the other people you're talking to. I personally think transparency generally is okay um, unless there's a really important reason not to, but everyone will give you a slightly different opinion. Um, yeah. Yeah, and I think if it's a firm that's that's leading and has set the terms, it's fairly typical or common for um, them to just them to set the terms around. The t you'll you'll say we're going to raise this much, and you sort of negotiate a little bit with them about how much they're going to take and how much will be left for everyone else. And then typically, as you're rounding out the round, you will share, um, you know, first rounds leading or home brews leading or whatnot. And there's this, there's as much left. Um, we're hoping to close in this amount of time. Um, so I'm, I'm mostly familiar with that being shared um, once that is committed. I think the only thing you want to be quite careful about is saying folks are committed before you know for sure. And um, and you, I think having that lead or anchor folks first uh, is uh, is probably the best path. That makes a lot of sense. And I would, I would say, like, I wouldn't share if people aren't yet, but you're just talking to them. Yeah. You know, like, I, I wouldn't. Like even yeah, I wouldn't I wouldn't be like yeah. So first round's leading, and I'm talking to these three people next week, because if they say no, then they're like, what happened to those people? And then it's just like not a, a good thing. I've also been in the situation like I mentioned where people often investors who are not acting in good faith, and there's unfortunately more than especially angels. It's maybe it's not bad faith. It's just whatever circumstance will commit because they want to save their spot, and then and then something will happen and they'll. So it, like you may think someone has committed just because they said, yes, I want to put in 250. Um, but a week later, things might have changed. And if you've told a bunch of people that, then it looks really bad. Um, so like I, I don't tell anyone until I get a signature. That's super shady, by the way, but it, it can happen. Though. It's happened to me several times. So like in the early in the early rounds. That's why it's also important to get the money as, as fast as yes. possible, because the, probably the longer, the, the worse. Yeah. I just realized I should repeat the question because uh, so that they so I'll, I'll start doing that. Um, so TechStars said don't share what the valuation is and just let people set it. But what are, what are people's thoughts on that? Uh, it was more like wait until you've got the round lined up and then the valuation is set by the kind of the reaching out and the you know you can then push it ahead because you've got mm. the traction. Mm. So be because you you have traction and there's m momentum and then the the valuation could get pushed up. So the question is is that right or should she try to set it? What are people's thoughts on that? I've seen it both ways. I probably most common. I've seen uh, we're looking to raise this much, getting some market feedback on price. Uh, I've seen serial entrepreneurs with really strong networks kind of just going in command. It's like this is what we're going to raise on this price. Um, so it varies a little bit in terms of um, access to capital and perception of um, how easy it will be. I, I've seen. I've seen some serial entrepreneurs going to raise a seed fund and they come out with a $10 million Series A because of networks and, you know, um, so I, th I think either way, um, but it probably comes down a little bit to um, uh, how confident you are about the raise and whether you genuinely want market feedback or you're like, I'm going to set a price and I know I can get it. You don't want to set a price and come back lower. I'd say, so what we did was um, we did YC, um, and we one of our advisors, um, we were telling him that we were, you know, t talking to investors and stuff, and he was really, really uh, deep in the trenches with us at, at the, um, during that time, and so he was, like, really categorical. He was like, this is, you know, the kinds of things, the kinds of money you should be making. This is this, this is this, and then he was like, go out and ask for this price. And then they're gonna say this, and then ask for this, and then they're gonna say this, and then ask for this. And we blindly just did exactly that. And um, it like we it, it ended up playing out exactly like he said. So, but. <laughs> well, it was just, in terms of just pricing, like it he was like, you're gonna say this number, and then they're gonna come back with you a little under there. And then you're, you're gonna say that, like, 
basically like just telling us what the negotiation was going to be. Um, and the, it like only because he had way, 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 way more experience than us um, raising money. Um, w and when like he also had helped us create like a um, atmosphere that like people were, it seemed like people were fighting over our round. Um, and I think that that and like he had leaked a price too. Um, and so that I think helped us um, that it didn't come from us first. It kind of was like, it was like, oh, you know, like someone told me that this was the round. Is that true? And then we were like, oh, you know, and then he, he was like, tell them the number is higher. And so then I, we said that and then they were like, but this was the round. And I was like, OK, well, then we went a little bit higher <laughs> and uh, he, they were like, OK, we can do that. And so um, we just took the advice of someone who knew way, way, way more than us. Um, so but we did give them a price. <laughs> yeah. Do you want to? I, I, so I, I go ahead if you. Okay, so yeah. the three questions were what about announcing a pre seed round? How do investors think about it? Um, for the seed, yeah. 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 Can pre-seed coverage support your seed fundraising? What about when investors put out press releases about the companies that they've funded? And then um, why do investors sometimes put logos or um, even nameless companies on their website and just call it like stealth robotics company, for example? Yeah. Um, I think if the press is makes a compelling case, um, I, I will tell you, like wearing my investor hat, it, it's always nice to see. I mean, it's not gonna hurt you. Um, I think that having a ton of press at the pre-seed may signal the wrong like message to investors in terms of where you're spending your time as a founder, especially if it's very much about like your personal story. Um, I would just be a little bit cautious about that as opposed to the product. Um, and this is, you know, me trying to balance both sides of my brain. Um, so I would just think about that, but um, Jessica should uh, weigh in and the others as well. Um, on the investors putting out a press release about the funding they gave you to your company, it is your funding, your company, you decide if you're gonna put it out or not. And um, that's how I feel about it. And I think you have really strong grounds to set that agenda or not. Um, and then in terms of like the stealth piece, uh, you know, in general, you know, the ecosystem is so small that people generally know the companies out there. And, you know, VCs like to make clear the areas they're playing in. They also don't want to out the companies that aren't ready to be public. So one way around that is either to name it if people are generally aware, oh, there's this, you know, we did this with a robotics company. Um, we had it, we had their name, Stealth Robotics Company, didn't say anything about it because people generally knew they were up to something, not specifically what. And then when we launched them officially, then we kind of added to the description. Um, so that, but it's again, like if the founder doesn't want anything on the website, then the VC firm usually doesn't put it on. And if they argue with you about that, you have very strong ground to stand on, I would argue. Thank you. Yeah. Ha, 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 ha.
I think it's totally appropriate to ask what's your typical check size. Yes. Um, people might give you a range, but they'll give you a number. Um, I think one thing you all might want to consider, that's something we face to hashtag angels a fair amount, sometimes you will give guidance on minimums um, just because it be can become unwieldy if you have tons and tons and tons of investors, pr um, particularly unsophisticated folks. But one thing you might want to consider is we at Hashtag Angels occasionally had to get people to lower the minimums because in some cases there is just tremendous like wealth and equity. And so if you do want to have a diverse cap table, um, it so sometimes if you fundraise, you might say, um, uh, someone might say, our typical check size is 25. And you in your head, you might be thinking, I only want to take checks that are 50,000 or higher because I don't want to have 20 people writing $5,000 checks. The only reason to think about that is it becomes an administrative burden in terms of the number of people you need to email um, for signatures or the number of people that you're going to be waiting on for wires. Or in some cases, you just have a cap table that's um, uh, that's so large it can just be it can be a little bit of a headache in some cases. Um, but you just might want to consider there may be people you really want to be a part of the company who are going to add a ton of value, but they're not in a position to write a hundred thousand dollar check, and they want to write a twenty thousand dollar check, and that's a choice. But we at Hashtag Angels had to sometimes get people to think a little bit more broadly about this um, to be a little bit flexible. As a side, you'll find this with like LP relationships if you ever want to get into funds too. Where they'll be like, there's a minimum. And you're like, yeah, but you know, part of diversifying this is like a reality of not everybody can write those size checks. Um, um, I'm sorry, I'm forgetting your second question. Um, yes, the question is, uh, is it worth the education on side for unsophisticated investors? That's a tricky one because the truth is this is such a risky investment and individuals investment will be locked up for a very, very long time and there's a totally decent likelihood it won't come back. Um, I've been investing actively as an angel for five years. Um, collectively across hashtag angels, we're in over a hundred companies. We've had maybe five go to zero. We've had a ton of markups. We may have three or four liquid. Like it takes a long, long time. And so for folks that aren't accustomed to that risk profile, um, I think you want to avoid a situation where particularly people you have a relationship with in three years are like, what happened to my 50K? Like I, I kind of need the liquidity for some other stuff. Um, at the same time, I think it's important to give access to people that aren't haven't always been playing this game. So it's it's, it's just a line a line that you have to kind of figure out where your tolerance and sort of appetite is on that. Um, yeah. Can I say something? Uh, kind of just related to both of those points because I think the I love this that you brought up access and bringing in. Um, you know, just like we're trying to get more females funded, there's a lot more females um, who could be investors. And women are so much more likely to write a philanthropic check than a check like this. And so letting those types of people in to this game, to this world, is really important. I found an awesome way to do it through Gingerbread Capital. Um, and there's other people like that. So essentially, and you mentioned a syndicate before, you could have a, something like a Gingerbread Capital or really just any angel who who's super excited, wants to bring in a bunch of friends, your lawyer can draft up a syndicate, and that way you don't have, you know, yep. too many $5,000 checks on your cap table. They're all in one syndicate. And ideally, 
it's run, the person who's out there getting all the people is also educating them so you don't have to spend your time doing that. In fact, like ideally, you're not even meeting those people unless they're like a friend or someone comes to you and you're like, oh, talk to this person who's leading the syndicate for me. So Gingerbread Capital um, does that for women. They have sessions where they actually like educate women investors who are new to investing. I would highly recommend reaching out to them, but also like anybody can do that. Mm -hmm. um, I've been in some deals where the founder has said, we don't want a ton of people in the cap table. We're, we have a syndicate hosted on AngelList. So we all wired into a fund that's managed uh, on an AngelList syndicate, and then the cap table for this founder just has one line item. Mm -hmm. um, and that takes care of that administrative burden I was alluding to. And I think your points are right on about yeah. this balance of bringing more people in. And yeah. And then the person, we have also a syndicate through AngelList, but, and the person who does all that work that we talked about has an extra carry, so they're actually getting compensated for doing that um, if it's structured in the right way. And then to your question about um, figuring out, like sizing up an angel, um, you can definitely ask. I never felt comfortable asking at the beginning of a phone call and had many phone calls where like I pitched my heart out and then got to the end and they said like, and I, I asked like, what's your typical check size? And they said 5K and I was like, oh, like this was like later in the process when I was like, I wish I hadn't w wasted that hour essentially. Um, so if you can hear, if you can ask that question to the person that introduced you, um, so you know whether you even wanna spend that hour um, is, is a good tactic. So to the similar point of Gingerbread Capital and AngelList, uh, I heard you say that you have diehard customers or users. So in our case, they were diehard parents, like who would just like, we don't want Zoom to, or we want to support Zoom in the funding, but we have we are not angel investors and we don't know what to do. So we found a way through Funders Club. Uh, of course, in Funders case of Funders Club, like they also qualify and they have to be willing to invest. But it was such an amazing process where many, many, many of our customers were able to participate in the round and they were vested in our service. They were using our service, but they also invested in the round. So that's another way if the investors are not sophisticated, but they are users of your service to have them participate. That's awesome. I was formerly the first employee at Funders Club, so I like hearing that. <laughs> that, was, that was where I was an investor. I was the first employee at Funders Club before starting Binti. Um, one other point on um, uh, unsophisticated yeah, yeah. <laughs> so one other point on unsophisticated is um, I think that all, all their points are, are spot on. I, I had some of my friends invest, and some of them who are founders are awesome. They're low maintenance. They know the deal. Um, I had one friend that was kind of not a founder but more just a person in tech that had some money and invested. And it, it was not the end of the world, but I, I think I wish I had given some expectations up front. So if you have someone... So kind of what Neri was saying, first of all, like, hey, like, you could lose all your money. Um, like, only do this if you're comfortable, like, saying goodbye to this. Um, and then also, um, like, I'm going to send these updates every month or every quarter. And in between, it's kind of the norm to not really ask me for things. <laughs> um, because, that, like, everyone who's sophisticated knows that. And founders know that. But, you know, he would kind of, like, ask me a bunch of questions and... Like it was just, it was kind of like, look, you invested a really small amount. It's kind of a favor. So I think you kind of need to, um, you you kind of need to like. I, I wish I had set expectations up front. So I would just do that. So if you set a closed day at the beginning of your process and someone actually needs more time, is it okay to move it? And I'll just briefly summarize, but yeah. Other people. Any thoughts? Sure. <laughs> um, so I think one of the things that we did was, I don't know if we set like a closed date, like I had a specific date, um, but it was like, uh, we just said like by the end of this week or by the end of next week, the round is gonna be it's going to be committed 
um, you can be in it or you don't have to be in it. I, I don't really understand when they say like it's going to take several, several weeks because um, like I like I, it was said earlier, but like I don't know what additional data points they will get in those additional weeks um, that they can't do in like these this week. And so I think just probably pu you can push back a little bit on that. Is why should they be spending like months and months trying to, or like weeks, you know, many weeks trying to suss out whether they want to invest in you? Chances are, like, they're going to spend like a certain number of hours on this, and they might as well. I just you just have to push for them to front load it um, to make you a priority. Um, otherwise, they don't, they don't, you know, just tell them like the round is going to be closing. So I don't know. It's a bit risky, but I think that it is good to show like. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'd love to hear from you guys, like if there's like a sweet spot of how much time is like enough to give you, like you feel a sense of urgency, but it's not like, oh, this person's trying to rush me or like I don't have enough time to get in on this and it's not worth it. So I'd love to hear that from the investor perspective. But I just want to put out a warning, which happens a lot where an investor, um, and this happened to me, like someone said they wanted to lead and they're like a reputable fund. They set the terms and then they just delayed and delayed and they had good reasons and I let it happen. And um, good reasons like, okay, this is a bad reason that sounded like a good reason at the time. Uh, we're raising a, a new special fund and there'll be so much PR around it and you'll be the first one. Don't ever like wait around for a fund that hasn't been raised or like this was a really, really good like um, reputable person. So I just kept giving them more and more and more time and it drew out the whole thing. Um, so I think if someone's not ready, like within a decent amount of time, like they got it, they just have to move on. You have to move on. It did happen ultimately, but it took a, it took a really long time and they set the terms and then waited, 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 waited. And I like raised telling everybody these terms. And by the time they actually wrote their check, like we could have had way better terms because our revenue was like so much more. So it's just, and I've heard this from founders time and time and time again, that uh, people will string them along. So Felicia's tip that you wanna get to yeses and nos really fast and no maybes, or no yes but wait, like for me, um, is a huge uh, point. Yeah, the other thing I'd mention is the lead is really your friend in this process. So oftentimes, whether that's a couple anchor angels that are helping with introductions, maybe they're even running the syndicate, maybe it's a seed firm, um, they're on your side with they want to close, they're committed, and if there's a couple of folks that are dragging their feet or being noncommittal or whatnot, they kind of look bad to both you and the lead, and those are relationships that everyone wants to keep. Um, so I think, uh, especially as a first-time founder, investors are here to help you. And so once you've got a couple of those strong folks signed up to support you in this round and they want to lead and they've set the terms, those are always easy phone calls for, hey, we were hoping to get this closed in the next week or 10 days or whatnot. This person says they need a little bit more time. Do you think it's worth accommodating that? Or does it seem reasonable to you? So that's always a friendly call because at that point you two are super aligned because now you're doing this together and you're both together trying to round out the round. I also think um, a question of they need an extra day or two for administrative reasons, sure. They need an extra month for a seed check. It's like, uh, I don't think so. So I, I think the devil's in the details here. And, and, you know, if it's someone you really want involved who's a luminary in the space, like maybe you give them a little leeway. If it's a super tiny check of someone that was kind of a favorite, maybe you don't. So it sort of depends on the circumstances. Mm -hmm. That all makes sense. I would, just, I would add that... Um, I don't think at the beginning you want to give an exact close date because I think you could be wrong and you could come across like um, you, were, you were bluffing and it's not honest or something. I think it's okay to be like, I have you know, this many meetings over this period. I think it's going to close quickly and kind of like give a sense of like the timing without being like, this is the close date. And then if, if you have a lead that sets a close date, then you can say that. But I wouldn't give like a specific date if you're not 100% sure too. 
The only other thing I'll add, sorry, is um, one, that the bigger partnerships that also do seed investing as opposed to the seed funds just have a little bit more internal process to run through. So that's probably an authentic request to like get enough of a quorum to have you come pitch potentially. Second, you will sometimes get introduced to an investor towards the end of your process and they need their time to do diligence. That's all to say, I got to tell you, like, it is a competitive environment for VCs to get in the deals that they want right now. And you can use that to your advantage. Um, and so it's okay for a VC to hustle over the weekend to do their diligence. They're not going to die. Um, <laughs> and I would tell you, like, the good VCs do work really hard. And they do, you know, do nights and weekends to, like, meet the deadlines that the founders that they want to be in on um, need from them. Um, so that can also help kind of separate. So um, I agree, it should just, like the maximum extra you should need to give someone is like a week to get to the next partner meeting. A couple other tips on what you can say. I'm realizing your point about this false precision of like, in your first meeting, you probably don't wanna say, and I'm gonna close on the 28th at noon. Um, <laughs> but what you can say is, I'm taking first meetings this week. Yeah. I have this many meetings lined up. You can say, I'm looking to pick the lead in the next week or two. And then once you get that solved, then you can say to folks, I'm looking to lock in allocations by this date. And then you get a, and then you're like, we're looking to close. Just that will give you these like little gates in a process that give you a little wiggle ring too without sort of false precision that maybe then ends up looking like um, you fumbled a little bit because it's hard to predict close uh, when you start. Allocations means more the amount. Yeah, typically like the signatures may be like at the 11th hour, but you have high, con they, they've told you in writing, we're in for this much. Like let us, like we'll connect the lawyers. So, um, and typically you just have to foreshadow that next milestones. You say, we're taking first meetings this week and next. Um, uh, and you say, we're hoping to lock in, the, you know, the lead at the end of that process. Um, I think you can, f if you don't end up finding a lead and you, uh, well, one, I, I don't think you need to proactively tell folks it's taking a little bit longer. You'd probably continue to be in dialogue and it will just become self-evident that, oh, we're still in conversation like a month later and the VCs will not only have, have the lead yet. Um, I think for all the reasons the panelists suggested. That's why preparation for this process matters so much. I used to, I did M&A for a decade and I would also tell folks, like the moment you step into that process, like a timer kind of starts and you have to be mentally prepared and particularly for M&A too, where it's so, t like once, once you kind of go down that path, you gotta be ready to run a process, but you don't want it open forever because then it just sends a weird market signal. Um, and so I do think there are ways to navigate. Let's say you go through a fundraising process and um, you might end up still closing around, but you raise a lot less than you think. That's okay. You're like, you know what? We closed around, got a bunch of more runway, and we're continuing to innovate on the product and are excited to touch base with you all again um, at the end of the year. Like, just then get out of that process. I would, I would give yourself a break and sort of go back to working before you then resurface. And when you resurface, have um, some um, new work to show for it. Um, so I think there are ways to navigate that, and that's maybe something we should dig into more in terms of when it doesn't go according to plan. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and also I think you mentioned telling people proactively, like I'm looking for a lead. I think that is like one approach. Um, I think another approach too is not really mentioning that and like just starting to close angels and then, because then you have the optionality of like you might get a lead and that's great, and then you're like, now I have a lead. Um, or you could be like, I'm just closing an angel round and mm -hmm. you know, just keep it open-ended. Some point. people never get a lead. Yeah. It, and you might do a bunch of angels and a syndicate, and that's that's kind of normal, too. Yeah. Do they tell you when they're leading? Like, do they say, I like Yeah. They say, we <laughs> like to lead rounds. <laughs> 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 it'll be like a term yeah. sheet, and it'll be for like a good chunk of the round. So that, that would be like from a fund. Mm -hmm. You know, angels, I mean, angels can give the first check, but they're not like leading the round. Leading it's means they put in the most money. Does everyone know that? <laughs> you, you would know going into it, this is a firm that only does seed rounds if they lead. 
They, yeah. Like, you know, for example, Canaan only leads our seeds, uh, seed series A. However, we recently launched like a separate seed program where we will just do 250 or 500 K checks um, in a decidedly non lead position. And we have to have a lead that the founder has to have another outside lead for us to be part of that syndicate. So you'll know just from their structure and getting to know them what their how they invest. So you'll know if they say yes, you'll know they're coming in as a lead. Yeah, I'm so glad you clarified that. I, I for GV, we do Series A and beyond where it's um, really common for there to be a VC lead. You are totally right. For a lot of seed rounds, it may just be you talk to a bunch of angels and you raise 500K of angel money and there's no single firm involved. And that's also totally normal. Yeah, keep it real. So, uh, I mean, a lot of angels invested because they were believed in the idea. Their kids were much bigger in our case. Uh, they didn't need the service, but they just believed in the idea. And it's also party conversation for them, telling that, oh, I invested in this cool company <laughs> type of thing. But there were few institutional investors. They were extremely helpful because they led to a Series A introductions. And uh, they actually led to the, their introduction actually led to a Series A round. Uh, so getting to the good institutional investors in the seed round can also help. And that's actually the uh, one of the, bigger purpose of seed round is to lead to the series A. Like all the angels, they count their success as, oh, the firm, the company actually had a very good series A and that for them is pretty good. That company is now set to the success for the next thing. So for us, that was the main help. Uh, rest of the things about business and all that at seed, seed stage, you don't have a board. Uh, usually seed uh, investors are not in the board. So it's pretty casual conversations. You're, there's nothing structured about it. They're not guiding you in a very structured way. If you want some help, you ask them uh, at that point. But primary help was in funding introductions for CDC. Um, I would say I got different help from the funds versus the angels. Um, we didn't have many p individual, like groups, parties were in our round. So everyone kind of had like, um, like decent allocation. Um, so I feel like th because of that, because it wasn't like s very, very splintered, everyone had felt very vested in kind of helping us. And also we were, we were super young. And so I think because of that, they're also like a little bit more hands on to make sure that we like, no, nothing is really moving the boat. Um, but uh, the angels and like the individuals who were in our round um, were more helpful. So like with day-to-day -day things, for example, um, if we were trying to, you know, something like, I don't know, uh, looking at like a, if we were looking at a financial sheet to see whether something would be like a good acquisition or um, if, like we, we wouldn't know how to really go through that, but like in an hour or like in two hours, I could send that and then I would get it back with like comments and like it would be a very active like, you know, Facebook discussion and like a phone call. And that was super helpful. And that those are like the quick turn things um, for things that were like longer lead, um, like finding a really good contact at the VA or something like that, that was like, I think they w those kinds of things are uniquely positioned for um, firms with like clout, clout or like more, um, maybe like something something that's greater than like a one individual person. So that because I just don't know if people would respond if it were that one person, but like intros and things like that to like larger bodies um, that were like prestigious or whatever, definitely um, was helpful when it came to the funds. And also, even if we did ask the angels, oftentimes they would say, you know, like, these guys know, would be do better than us here. Um, so I think it, it has been, um, like, they've both been pretty helpful, but in very, very different ways. Uh, oh sorry, no, go ahead. I would say your investors, you'll get as much out of the ra relationship as you put in. So during the fundraising, ask what can you be helpful with, make notes about that. Um, send frequent updates, even if you're feeling like sheepish that nothing has happened, like it's really good to keep in touch with them um, so that they feel involved and then you can ask them for the things that 
like they said that they could be helpful with. Um, there's, I've learned that there's like three W's. Um, someone told me that when I was re raising my seed for what to look for in investors, work, um, wealth, and wisdom. So s some people will you know, just give you great advice. Like I have a couple angels who are Harvard Business School professors and they're super wise. Um, and then there's people with just deep pockets and then there's people who will roll up their sleeves and like lead a whole syndicate for you. Um, so you can think about it that way. Yeah. May I one more oh, thing? Yeah. These communities are gold for these questions because you will get the most honest and best answers from other founders. Like who showed up for you, who was helpful, who made the intros, and that's why the people in this room or other uh, founders that have been in these chairs or are a little further along um, are gonna be the best references for all of you. Mm -hmm. I would also add that, you know, not every investor has to be super value add. I think you want, like, because in my experience, like, you can only, I can only really have a few investors that I'm kind of talking to frequently other than sending the investor updates. You, you, like, for me, I have quite a few angels for my seed. I can't be having monthly calls with all of them or something. So I have, like, a few that I talk to regularly. The other ones I send the email updates and I'll ask for a specific ask. And that's okay. Um, and so... Like, yeah, it's it's ideal to have people that add value, but it's also okay to have people kind of like that just have deep pockets and will write a supportive note to you and like occasionally make an intro um, as long as they don't provide har like add any harm or, or really annoying or anything. And by keeping in touch, that's also what I meant. Like yes, a group exactly. email yes. with an update. And I love what you said, like it's setting expectations up front. Like this is how I keep in touch with my investors because mm -hmm. people who want to just meet with you and talk to you all the time are sometimes more of a time suck than a value add. Do you want to share a recent nope. thing? <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes people have more expectations of meeting than, than you want to do. I'll, I'll share it. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, so there was an older guy who invested very quickly. And he. I should have read the signs because he was like, I'm really investing for you. And I was like, okay, <laughs> just give me the money. And then <laughs> later, and then he kept requesting to meet and like have dinner and I should come over and like, and then... He said he I wasn't giving him the the close relationship that he wanted and asked for his money back. Oh. Yeah. No, I mean I'm not under obligation to, and I took him off my investor. He threatened to like ruin my name. Um, I took him off our investor updates, so he never hears from me. But he's still I still have his money, and just be really careful. <laughs> yeah. So that's why, I mean, it's hard to do diligence on, on every angel that you take, but, like, it is helpful, like, now, yeah. like... Yes. I, I took you know. his money quickly because I had in been introduced by another founder, and then later I was like, what the hell? Like, why did you introduce me to that guy? And they were like, oh, I didn't even know him. He asked to meet you. <laughs> like, I should have asked those questions before. Like, has he invested? Has like, he, yeah. Do yeah, done mm -hmm. the duties. I assumed he was an investor in their company. Like, don't assume anything. Yeah. Yeah, so actually just like not doing harm is actually like like good. Like you actually that's the minimum that you want to hit. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. So if you're in the middle of raising around you're not sure you're going to close it, how do you message that and move forward? Um <laughs> No, no, it definitely does. It definitely does. I, well, Go ahead. For folks, so let's say you take some meetings, and um, for everyone that gave you a no or gave you a, like, um, really enjoyed meeting you, I think we're still trying to, like, understand the space, would love to keep in touch, you do not need to follow up with them. So there's a bunch. I think the only, f um, the only folks that you would be in a situation um, to keep that dialogue with is, let's say you're gonna try to raise 500 and you kind of circle the wagons and you're at like 250. Um, then I think um, keep it short, keep it forward looking. Like we got a group together, really excited to have in the cap table, ended up raising 500. Uh, this is gonna give us runway to accomplish these goals and we'll probably be f you know, just adjusting our runway and hold off on making that higher. Um, that happens. Um, and I think the nice thing about seed stage, you can do a seed one and a seed two. You could do a raise on a safe. And um, I meet companies all the time that are like, yeah, we did. We ended up raising like one and a half in um, notes that kind of came in over the course of a year. 
Um, so once you get to a series A and a series B and a series C, it is demarcated in a more episodic, like distinct way where if you go from an A and you don't get to the B, you do a bridge. That's okay. But there's sort of like, oh, th there's something that like didn't quite meet expectations. The seed you can you can more commonly fundraise in a series if you need to. And it's all part of the pre-series A seed funding sort of mix. And it, it doesn't carry um, a ton of connotation with it, particularly with if you raise on a safe or a convertible note. I will have people say, we raised this much. You know, notes kind of came in over the course of a year. So, I mean, from a messaging standpoint, like the facts are always the facts. And it's not like people aren't going to understand that you couldn't get to the full amount you were going for, that you didn't get the lead. And so I think I agree completely. Like it's better to be authentic and real and like clear eyed and just say, you know, we ended up just raise, we decided, we ended up raising 250 um, and decided to just move forward with this, um, get further along and then um, come back to the market once we are hit a couple of additional milestones. And I think people will respect you for it. It does happen. Um, so I, I think transparency and authenticity always sells. And I think it's good to kind of cut it off and get back to work as opposed to keep yeah. going. Don't just keep it open. Because then like, you need to make some progress like for the next, for the next um, for raising more. And, and just being in the market forever, yeah. just in an ongoing basis, is like the worst thing, I think. I think it's better to just say, okay, we're going to close what we have right now and sprint for three months and then go back out than to stay open for six. Mm -hmm. That's my personal opinion. And I think that um, also setting expectations lower at the beginning can help with this too in terms of how much you're raising. Like, you know, set, setting it at a smaller number um, even if you're like range or range, like even if you're thinking of a bigger number and then you might, you might like hit less than you thought, but you did what you said like too. So yeah, yeah. I did that. And that was, that's a really good tactic. Yeah. Um, and then also I just wanted to say something on process because this wasn't mentioned last week, but um, I found it really helpful. Uh, an investor just told me, cause I'm going to raise my series A soon. He said, line up like, you know, 10, 15 meetings, whatever for the first week. And then a lot of founders don't do this, but build in a break because um, you'll have time to like reassess. Like if somebody's asking a bunch of questions that you haven't figured out, like you can at figure that out, add it to the data room. Or uh, if you don't have a data room, you just like, you, you recalibrate, you might need to, um, course correct a little bit and then so having the meetings in chunks but taking a few days of a break in between I thought was a smart way to run a process So should they raise in the summer and then if you get the break even question how do you how do you handle that? Any thoughts? <laughs> um in terms of raising in the summer. Um I I don't know if this is I mean it, it just makes sense to me but I don't know if it makes sense in general. Um but it would seem like you w uh, there's always if there's some sort of external pressure that kind of ends the fundraising cycle, like um, for us, it was, uh, we, we did YC and there was like demo day. And so we were just in the week before demo day, the demo day was kind of like an external pressure that was like, okay, demo day is gonna happen, we're gonna go public and we're gonna tell all these investors about us and they're all gonna want in on the deal. And so um, that was like an external event that was happening that kind of helped things come to an end. Um, I would say if you can try to like find something in, like whether it's that's in the summer or like 
in December or um, wh whatever it, it may be. If I would time it close to like that sort of event, or if you, you have like, if you're putting out a bunch of data really soon and you can say like, I'm gonna do this and everyone's gonna know how amazing this is, then, um, then I think it doesn't really matter when you do it. Um, but like if, if they're interested, then they're gonna be interested no matter when. Um, but I, I don't know how like practical or feasible that advice is. Um, in terms of the break even question, um, I haven't been asked that question. Um, I, you know, maybe that's uh, lucky, um, but I also think that if I were asked that question, I would, that's not to say, that's not like a bad question. That's just a question you have to answer. Like you can pose it to say like, this is when I think it will happen in, in like maybe a few years, but um, or like maybe I'm gonna be profitable this year. And that may, that's, that's good, right? Like I don't think that's a bad thing. I don't think it's a bad thing for investors to want to ask that because if I were an investor, I would wanna know that because it's like, how, when am I, you know, when are you thinking about returning the money? Um, or like, is it, it's like it's, I guess it's like a comfort thing. Um, but I can understand why that, like that, that's like, and in a, like a bad, like it has a negative connotation as well. But <coughs> I, I, I would never say like, don't expect questions to be on the table. Cause like everything is gonna be on the table. But like, I think everything is spinnable. Um, as she mentioned, you know, like anything is spinnable. So if you're, if you're super worried about that question, it's probably worth spending some time just be like having like a super solid answer that like really puts them in their place. Um, that's what I would, probably do if you're super concerned about that. So actually, uh, th to that point, our business is very unit economics business, specifically in the marketplace uh, thing. Surprisingly, nobody asked us in the seed stage uh, that question, but in Series A, once you have more data and you have been performing the service, that kind of question is very natural. Uh, looking back, I wish they had asked because that got us very disciplined about thinking about our customer acquisition cost, our operations cost, our OPEX. And now in CDC, we are super disciplined about it. Like we almost like see it daily, daily basis and monthly basis, of course, with the month end close, we look at it. So uh, to the pickers point, that could be to your advantage of a new way of looking at business unless you think that that's stopping you from raising the fund, or it's a wait for them to say no. Yeah. And yep. Mm -hmm. So my question is more around introductions. And I was just trying to, like going out there, getting introductions to founders in that fund or angel groups who have invested in those funds. What's a good way to reach out to a founder and ask them for an introduction? Because I also, like these people are running their companies and asking them for feedback slash introductions or can I take you out for coffee introductions? What's like a good way to ask a founder mm -hmm. that you don't know? So founders hate getting emails um, asking for introductions to their investors if they don't know you. Um, I'll, I'll like forward it, but I'll be like, I don't know this person, FYI, they asked me. Um, because I, I don't know you and I don't know that I can vouch for you and I don't want it like on my name. Um, and and so I think you need to actually like meet with the founder and, and not have it be just for the intros. And so I think I respond better if, if founders are like, hey, I'm like trying to raise money, we're in a similar space and like would love to practice with you. I'll come, I'll come to your office, I'll make it really easy for you. And like, like it's more about asking my advice um, for, for fundraising in general. And then if, if you do that, and then if, um, 
I seem excited or whatever, you know, then, then it's like, okay, would you pass like a blurb to your investors? Would you open to that? But it's kind of like the afterthought, even though I'll know that that was like a, a big part of it. Um, no, no, no. No, it's it's good. It's it's expected to do that at the end, but it's it should be like after you've asked like other advice and like you've gotten me excited about your company, um, because now I'm like excited about you and I'm like, oh yeah, I want to help and like I feel good about putting my name on this to an email and I'm gonna say something nice about her. Um, so yeah, that would be my suggestion. I'm sorry if I'm like counter programming to what you guys have already said. And yeah. yes, warm introductions is important, but if you're going to go through all that to get a VC intro with some founders, you should also send some cold emails to some founders, uh, um, excuse me, some VCs on your list. A well thought out, well matched email to the right VC doesn't always go nowhere. And so um, if you're going reaching out cold to a founder to get the email intro to the VC, you might as well also like throw some throw some of those out there. I don't know if Jessica disagrees with that, but depending on how that email is written, you can find people's email addresses. It's pretty easy. Um, it can, you can make a compelling case just by the way you introduce yourself. It's not, shouldn't be your whole strategy, but it can be a piece of it. The, sorry, I just I just had a question. Uh, do you guys read all the emails that you guys get? Because you have, like, isn't it in your best mm -hmm. interest to read all those emails? Yeah, we do. And at our scale, particularly, I think this is an area where also the Google brand may mean that our inbound, just because that has a fair yeah. amount of notoriety, it just comes from all over. So we do. We have a process where so, um, we... Uh, Partners will read their own for stuff that um, we have no context on. We can also forward and all get screened and then resurface to people that are best in terms of match for industry domain. Um, in a perfect world, maybe in a decade in Silicon Valley, this will be less relationship driven. I hope so. Right now, it still is a very relationship driven network. Um, but maybe think a little bit, founders are one community, and think a bit about the communities where you've already built some trust and you've built some rapport, and that might be the community that's gathered here tonight. It might be people you've worked with in the past. Again, thinking about who has context on the work I'm doing that is going to be, that's up for betting on me or vouching for me. Maybe someone you worked for, maybe the investors of the company you used to work at, maybe it's the community in this room. And starting with those places where you've already been You've just been building that context for quite a while. Um, and then from there, I think you can continue to expand to like doing the research that, hey, I've seen, like I've talked publicly about a handful of spaces I'm really interested in. You're working on that exact space. Like I've seen people follow up when I've spoken at a conference about a, a specific thing and, and they'll write, be like, I'm building a company in that space. And I'm like, right on, let's chat. Um, I think that's probably more effective than um, uh, even the unknown founder intros where you're asking for a favor for someone who doesn't have a ton of context and is really busy. Um, for seed stage, I am less, I, it is less common to see a whole data room. Um, that's much more common at the series A, series B, and beyond. Um, so typically, um, a deck and, um, a pretty crisp message on here's what we're building, uh, and in some cases a demo or product walkthrough. Um, I think at this stage, you're trying to convince someone um, you're trying to convince someone that you have a vision for something that you want to build that you think like the world is ready for this and some way to indicate that like the world is ready for this and I've built it and I've got this early feedback and typically the early feedback you're not gonna have quantity you don't have scale now but maybe you've got some anecdotes that are just striking a chord um, and you have the background and sort of personal narrative that makes you really equipped to build this company. And if you're right, this could be really big. Um, and so for that reason, 
I actually think founder references matter quite a bit. So that the diligence oftentimes, maybe people will ask for references. Oftentimes a lot of this happens just through back channel. So where you worked previously, if folks will be like, hey, did you work with so-and-so? What was your, was this one of the top people you've worked with in your career? That's kind of the, it's not, were they good? It's like, was this the best person you ever worked with is, is kind of the, the way that you want to try to stand out as someone that's willing to just bet on you not having that primary data point. Um, and then I think the, the work on finding the right match is so important because there's some people that um, are really passionate about the space, whether it's self-driving cars or automation or ag tech or plant-based um, plant foods or um, you know, social networks or membership clubs. And if, y if you can find that match, that means they probably are not starting from square one in terms of all the work that they need to do to familiarize themselves. If you have, most of it will be anecdotal, but if you can amass some customer references as well, um, that is really, really important, especially if your product is replacing a, something else that they were using for a long time. That's particularly true in enterprise or SaaS. Um, and then um, for technical diligence, you wanna just be thinking upfront how you're gonna give investors access to that, um, depending on your company, if that's relevant. Um, and they're gonna wanna walk through it. They're gonna wanna see it. Um, and then, yeah, I was gonna say references and just offering the references right out of the gate, even though the back channels will win in the end. Pros and cons of raising from top tier investor versus a newer investor that is, is newer to the scene, but you you're, you're excited about. Um, well, a couple of comments. One is this is a very long relationship you're entering into, and so part of the importance, particularly of your seed funders, is um, kind of having that for a long time. Seed funders over time tend to move off of boards, so it's less about that, but just someone who you want in your corner. Um, I personally in my life like to optimize for like the relationship and the kind of f feeling of having that right match. Um, but money is money. Right, the thing that's you just have to be careful. You have to diligence a new fund and a new investor in the same way they're diligencing you. You should diligence the long-standing top-tier ones too, but um, you're going to have more work to do on the newer um, entrants um, because you need investors who are also going to be there for you. So if it's their first fund and it's small, um, you got to ma just make sure they're going to be able to be there for you if you need to do another note you know, before you get to your Series A. And so that's like the, the, the flip side. But if you have a mix, I think that's, that's strong. And you wanna, what do you need as a founder? What do you want? Um, you ultimately need to make the call for, it's very personal, I, pers I think. But money is money. Also, VCs really um, like to uh, get those signals when a top fund is in, everybody will want to be in. It's just the way it works. So that makes it really easy to close your round quickly. Um, it's unfortunate, mm -hmm. but it is how it works. Um, and then the other consideration is, like um, it was said already, Neri said, um, but it's, it's helpful if they can also be part of your A. Yeah. Like, that's a really good thing. Um, on the downside, uh, if they don't exactly. come into your A, it's a bad signal to the market. Like, why didn't they go in? Everybody's watching those top tier funds to see what they're going to do. Yeah, I personally wouldn't, uh, people have different opinions. I personally, sorry, would not take money f for the seed from a, from a fund that leaves an A um, just because of that signaling risk. And like, yeah, and so <laughs> just, uh, so if a, if a firm leads Series A's, mm -hmm. but they also invest in seed rounds on the side, um, 
I personally wouldn't take money at the seed. People have different opinions. Some people do it. The reason is because if they don't end up leading your A, it's a negative signal and everyone will be like, but they were in your seed and they 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 have been getting all your updates, so they might not might, like must know something I don't know and that's why they're not investing. Um, so I think like first round, they only do seed rounds. They let our seed, so there's no expectation that they would lead our A, so it's like a fresh start. So uh, that's how I feel. There's also advantages. I mean, if, if they really love you, then they'll just lead your A. So that's like really nice. Mm -hmm. So there's advantages, but that's that's how I feel, but other people disagree. So did, did you have the opposite yeah, experience? Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, uh, so we had a big fund lead our seed. Um, and that was like the thing that everyone was saying. They were saying ne negative signaling if they don't lead your A. And then I remember that was something that we brought up. And of course, they're used to hearing that too. So they had like a super prepped like package they sent us. Um, but it was basically <laughs> like, these are all the funds. I mean, these are all the companies that we led their, we, we did their seed. Um, these are, th and then exactly what happened with every single company. This one went, you know, didn't do well. This one didn't do well. This one did Super well, we were priced out of their A. This one, we led their A. We didn't lead. Their, we wanted to lead their B. We got priced out of their B. Like it, like it was everything was very clear. And so, and then um, I remember they were just like saying, you know, if it's a good company, uh, like if it's a company that is doing well, we will put money in it. And I was just saying like I want to build a company that's doing well. So I didn't want to like go into that with like fear. Um, and it didn't they end didn't up. Lead your a or something uh, they like were that. priced out of our A, so. Um. You did well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think it's like ones that are a little bit less clear. Like that's the optimal thing if you're just doing great. But I know some companies that like they're able to raise an A, but it's not like a super, super, super competitive one. And like in those situations, it already might be a little hard. And then if you have that too, so it's just you know, just depends. Um, okay. All right. We only have a few minutes left. Um, so we'll just take one more question. Okay. Yeah. Talking about the amount of raises. So I kind of laid out the, the two main kinds of amounts that we kind of put in the seed. Do you go out to hit the next round and then you just try to kind of top it? Or do I go out to the 18 rounds and then I can say, here's all the milestones that we raised and the amount that I would raise them. Because I know depending on the company, it's Good question. I think you are. Yeah. Oh yeah. Or uh, I think the, the spirit of the question is, how do you gauge how much to raise and whether to Sorry. sort of swing for the fences for enough to give you more runway, or maybe start with a more modest amount and sort of sequence that. Um, I think you alluded to this earlier, but in general, setting more modest expectations and overachieving on them is just generally always better. But if there's some way. Um, for you to socialize in the, within the communities you're in, like kind of where you're at relative to peer companies in terms of maybe it's just you and a co-founder and you're raising on vision and team. Maybe you've been at this for a couple of years and you have a prototype and you really know kind of what comes next and you're feeling really confident about where you're at. Maybe you're privileged to be in networks where um, you know you are a serial entrepreneur or you're coming out of a really noteworthy company with access to a lot of people that can write checks you have to kind of gauge a little bit what feels realistic for that um, but in uh, in general I think a more modest expectation I have a friend raising right now who started out talking to angels and was just gonna ask some of the seed firms for some feedback such that she was aiming to aim raise a smaller angel round continue to build these mentorship relationships, which gave them a chance to bite and like really broaden the round, but that wasn't her expectation. And I think that's an, if, um, I think that's a nice, I think that's an uh, approach that gives you a lot of optionality um, while you're trying to figure out what feels right for you. Yeah, and I think it's okay to say different amounts to different people. I think we mentioned this in the last one, but like when you're meeting with the angels, I think it's okay to be like, yeah, I'm raising like 500K and I'm open to talking to funds and expanding the round and when you're raising with funds, if you say you're raising 500K, that's too small. You're not thinking big enough. They like writing bigger checks than that. So it's okay to them to be like, yeah, I'm raising a lot from angels, looking to raise 2 million. Um, 
So I think that's okay too. <laughs> Everybody does it. So uh, as mentioned before, like in seed round, you have a lot of leeway. Uh, in the sense, in Series A or Series B, you have to be very firm, like how much you're raising, because the word gets out, and you can't say different things to different people. But when you're raising the angel round and seed round, you you should put less pressure on yourself to be accurate on closing date or closing amounts, because you can play by the year, uh, like mm -hmm. Felicia mentioned, like you can raise uh, 250K or half a million from angel investors based on that success, then you can go to institutional round or vice versa. You can have parallel tracks and th that can work out for, for you too. So you can't be that accurate in the seed round. You have the leverage to be a little bit flexible and just keep going. Exactly. That's right, that's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and I also don't think it's like dishonest at all, like to to do that because I think like I would have closed it with 500k if that's all I got, you know. So I think there's like a plan for 500, there's a fi plan for two million. Um, there's also okay. Yeah, there's also that saying: raise twice as much as you need. Yes. Um, because everything costs twice as much and takes twice as long. That's for real. <laughs> um, so like. I know a lot of founders who will raise just a little bit of money because they're like, you know, we want a higher valuation, and then and then they don't get to where they wanted to be with that little money. Um, so, add in some buffer. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah that makes sense. Okay, awesome. So, um, I want to talk about next steps. So we've spent these last four weeks together, um, and we definitely want to keep in touch. So, Niharika, thank you for creating a WhatsApp group. Um, it's been super active just in the last few days, so that's been fun. Um, and there's only founders on there, so it's only you all and then uh, me, Zara, and Celine that are part of uh, the um, organizing group. So you can be super vulnerable. You can, you know, you don't need to be impressing any investors in there. Um, and then Niharka also sent out an email with everybody's email and phone number. So if there's a, you know, a certain person that you want to connect with, that is a similar space you want to pitch practice with, hopefully you can do that. Um, and then in the coming week, you're all going to get matched with a mentor who has raised a, a seed round before of at least $2 million. Um, and some of them will have gone on to raise other rounds too. And so you can connect with them and you can do a pitch practice, um, ask other more targeted questions, etc. cetera. Um, and then there's also, I think we, we've alluded to this in the past, um, we also have a network of investors in All Race um, that we want to help when you're ready. So some of you are raising right now and you're like super ready. Other ones, you're thinking about it in six months. Um, when you're ready and like, so how it, how it has worked in the past, as you know, you're kind of the, the first class of this. Um, how we've done it in the past is that when a mentee has a one-on-one -on -one in female founder office hours, the mentor has to basically vouch for them and say, hey, they did their pitch practice with me. I think they're good to go. And then they send their blurb to me. So I think the plan was to kind of do the same thing with the mentor that you're getting right now. Um, if you do the pitch practice with them and, and they're like, yep, I think it's good to go, I would send them to my investors. Then they'll connect it with me, give me the blurb. And then we have um, a network of investors. So all, a bunch of the all raise women VCs um, and then a bunch of other investors as well. So basically we've asked the mentors in female founder office hours to ask their investors if they want deal flow from, from Field Funder Office Hours. And a lot of them said, yeah, I want pre-vetted deal flow. Um, <laughs> and so, yeah. And, and so, uh, and so like we send the, the blurbs to them and we'll, we'll um, target it based on like sector, you know, so if it's consumer and things. And right now it's just consumer enterprise healthcare. We're gonna make it even more targeted soon. Um, so we'll send the blurb and then if they ask for an intro, we'll introduce you. So, um, We'd love to help accelerate your round when you're ready. Um, we also don't want to send you out if you're not ready. So I just want to say that like your mentor should, should vouch. Like if, if you're not ready then, we can pair you with another mentor in a few months or something. Um, and then we have a little bit of a screening process. We've, we've done it with um, about 30 women over the last year. And some women have raised most of their round through it and it's been like hugely helpful. And we've had women that that we've introduced to like 30 people and they got zero checks from it. And so that was actually the genesis of this um, because we realized that someone would just like weren't ready and we were introducing them to a bunch of people and then they were just 
doing like not being successful so that's why we wanted to have you have this foundation going into that but also know that we'll do a little bit of vetting to make sure that you're going to be successful before we send you out on that so we might like have some iterations with you um so th i think that's all we're so grateful that you joined us for this um this has been really fun and we definitely want to keep in touch um, we're also going to send an nps like survey and would love to hear your feedback because this was a huge experiment we want to know what we did well what we could do better we're going to do another one in august so we want to iterate based on your feedback so thank you so much <laughs>